Good morning. This is the Oregon State Marine Board. We are currently in Brookings, but not Brookings. <laughs> We're in Gold Beach. I'm sorry, Curry County. Uh, I'm from Brookings. Anyway, uh, first thing I'd like to do is I would like to uh, welcome our Curry County Sheriff, and that is um, Sheriff John Ward. He's in the back of the room. And also would like to say thank you to Eddie Prashani for putting together a wonderful tour yesterday for the board members. Uh, we were able to join the law enforcement jet training and had an incredible day uh, on the boats of uh, Walter Sherbarth from Curry County, Jason Denton from Jackson County, Dion Blake from Lincoln County, Will Coleman from Coos County, and Eric Schinfeld from Lane County. So we really had a wonderful day and got to be able to see a lot of what they do and their training and the importance of our law enforcement partners. So with that, we are going to start into our agenda and uh, first order of business is the approval of minutes. Make a motion that we approve the minutes as written. A second that. Okay, a uh, motion and a second for the April 6th to 7th, 2022 minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and now we are going to move on to our request for public comment. Um, the first thing we're going to do is to go over a couple of rules of engagement. First of all, uh, we're going to be able to allow two minutes for each of the speakers. Some people will be online and some people will be here uh, in the room with us. And then um, just so that the public is aware, the way public comment works is that the board members do not engage we allow you to, to make your statement for two minutes and we do not engage with you, so there will be no questions or additional comments. Uh, if a comment period has been closed on an item that is on our agenda, technically we should not be considering that comment during the public comment in our decision making today as that comment period has been closed. So the first person that we are going to welcome here this morning to um, to get us rolling is Sheriff Ward. Good morning. Would you like to make any comments, Sheriff? I don't have any comments at this time, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, we will start then on our sign-up list and that is Everett Beasley. Everett, are you on the line? You would need to unmute yourself if that's the case. Star six if you're on your phone. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on then, and um, we will try to come back if we still have time. So we have Rick Stiggins. Please, if you are on the line, make sure you state your name and where you're from. Hi, good, 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 good morning, everyone. My name is Rick Stiggins. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, we are. Good. Um, I am, uh, I live along the Willamette River in West Lynn, uh, and I'm an avid boater and really active fisherman. Uh, and I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I support lowering the shoreline decibel limit from 84 to 75 decibels. <clears throat> This is the standard that has been adopted by states throughout the West. And I believe we, as to my neighbors, that we should align with them. For the last year and a half, my family, along with my neighbors, have experienced the impact of the noise of two or three two-stroke engine-powered jet skis that far exceed 75 decibels um, as they perform their acrobatics. Um, they, they, in fact, they were back within, they've been back within the last few days. Um, when they're in operation out there, it's impossible for us to even converse outside, uh, let alone uh, enjoy the neighborhood that we live in. This has got to stop. I grew up on the water 
um, and, and have experienced the evolution of the boating technology over the last 78 years. Um, and I can, and I, I expect you probably know that almost all the watercraft manufactured over the past 20 years fall far under 20 deci or 75 decibels. There's no need for this noise given today's technology. We know better and we can do better. I know that you have heard from many of my neighbors and virtually every civic leader along the lower Willamette. They want a 75 decibel limit, as do I and my neighbors. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rick, very much. And um, we're, we have several people signed up, um, but it, in the meantime, we have had a local Curry County Commissioner uh, join us for our meeting. So I would like to welcome uh, Commissioner Court Boyce to our meeting at this time. And uh, Commissioner Boyce, would you like to say any, anything? Um, just that I was proud to serve with the Marine Board for eight years, 1996 to 2004. I brag a little bit though, I missed one meeting in 33 and uh, it was just a tremendous honor. And I volunteer and met some incredible people in the years. So thank you for that acknowledgement. And thank you for coming to Curry County. Very much appreciated. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Boyce. We're happy to be here. Okay, let's move on to uh, Lisa Beatty. Are you on the line? I'm on the line. We, we heard a little bit. Hello? Yes. I'm sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Lisa Beatty. I am a city councilor in the city of Milwaukee uh, and a candidate for mayor this fall. Um, I, I'm calling in in support of the same rule for uh, re uh, restricting noise levels along the lower Willamette. I actually, um, I won't repeat what uh, the previous person testified to or what's in the um, petition materials you've seen. I think there's a lot of, of good uh, reason for, for lowering the rule. I, frankly, I think there's a lot of good reason for lowering the rule statewide, but certainly on the lower Willamette, which is not a river of commerce. It is only a river used for uh, you know, recreation, and we should be able to find a, um, a happy medium that allows recreation without um, impinging upon the uh, enjoyment of the property along the Willamette, which is not only private property, but parks. Uh, we have many parks along the lower Willamette and, and natural areas. And, and, uh, and that's what I wanted to throw into the mix today is here in Milwaukee, we have Milwaukee Bay, which is where Kellogg Creek and Johnson Creek empty into the Willamette. And it's adjacent to Elk Rock Island, which is an 11 acre natural area where we have nesting Eagles, or we used to have nesting eagles. Um, they have not returned to their nest the last couple of years, and we don't know why. Um, we have peregrine falcons on the Elk Rock cliff face on the other side. We have lots of, of great um, bird life and natural area here, and the noise also is a detriment to them. Um, and I guess that's the main point I want to make. I think, uh, it, you know, Oregon is a home rule state. Uh, localities should have the ability to set rules they want to set, um, and to the extent that the state is setting a rule that's statewide, I think we need more flexibility uh, in um, on the lower Willamette. And so I encourage you to pass this rule. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, David Dickerson. David Dickerson, are you on the line? You will need to unmute yourself. Star six. Okay, we will try to come back to that one. Robert McCarthy, are you on the line?
Robert McCarthy. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning on this hot and hazy day in the Willamette Valley. My name is Robert McCarthy. I'm president of the Bolton Neighborhood Association, which is a shoreline community located on the lower Willamette River, representing 2,200 residents and businesses. I've been a boater since a boy, and I've sailed many thousands of miles. It seems to me that the issue before you is on the one hand a simple one, and the other complicated. Simple in how can you ensure equitable use of the waters of the Willamette River for all, and complicated in that there are many voices and interests involved. Some history may help, and you may know of this history, but it's been interesting to me. 84 decibels, the current shoreline noise limit in Oregon, is a watercraft noise limit established in, 19, in the 1970s. With, it, with advancements in engine muffling technology, all our neighborhood states updated their rules and lowered their noise limits to 75 decibels to ensure peaceful coexistence between those who enjoy the water and those on the shoreline near it. I believe it's time for Oregon to do the same by lowering the shoreline noise limit to 75 decibel for all watercraft, at least near public parks, wildlife areas, and residential areas like we have in Bolton. The shoreline measurement method currently used, I've come to find out, is J1970 and accompanying recommended 75 decibel noise limit was established by the National Voting, Boating Policy Experts and the boating industry itself decades ago, specifically to take into consideration the needs of both recreational boaters and shoreline communities. Shoreline Robert, is right there in the name, yet Robert, in 20, yes. Um, your two minutes are up, uh, so you will need to wrap it up, please. Well, I think that you can make a cutout for an exception for police and emergency vehicles. It's time to set a noise limit that it equitably meets the needs of all. The public health of my community is at stake, and there seems no convincing reason to stick with the status quo. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian Celeron. Christian. Christian Celeron. Uh, Christian Celeron. Thank you. We can hear you. Momentarily, we heard you. Hmm? Okay. Okay, we're going to move. We'll, we'll come back to you, Christian, if you were on the on the line. Matt Radich. Uh, 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 thank you for taking the time to listen to my very brief comments this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Radich. I'm the president of Active Water Sports, an Oregon uh, recreational boat dealership. Uh, and both personally and professionally, I oppose um, sections of this noise petition uh, that was filed with the Marine Board. And I'm specifically addressing the narrative standard and the reasonable person standard and the restriction of, of tricks. Um, those parts of this uh, petition were um, another unreasonable attempt uh, to limit activities that a group has decided they don't like. 
people will never agree on what is too loud or what kind of activities are imprudent or unsafe. Uh, making these uh, subjective judgments will only make for more conflicts and wasted resources. Um, <clears throat> one important fact I want uh, I kind of want to remind everyone about too is these uh, these issues we're talking about are are in one very specific area in the state. They are, they are not a statewide issue. Um, before voting on these proposals, um, and I know there's several that you need to look at. Please ask yourself if these amendments are reasonable or necessary. And I think uh, you'll find on at least two of them, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Ben Rice. Ben Rice. Hello. Are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, can hear me? we can hear you. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Ben Rice. I'm a active member of the rowing and paddle sport community. Um, I've had, uh, I've coached rowing on various bodies of water uh, all uh, throughout Oregon, um, Lower Willamette, Corvallis, uh, Dexter Lake, Eugene, Emigrant Lake, and Ashland. And I can say that it is not necessarily an isolated issue as um, as people kind of think. It's not just on the lower Willamette uh, in Westland, Milwaukee area. It's, uh, you know, there are exceedingly loud boats that cause safety issues for, for recreational paddlers and rowers um, on all those bodies of water that are far exceeding the reasonable uh, volume level that uh, is present and that lowering the shoreline limit 75 decibels would be a major safety um, improvement for rowing and other sports so that we can maintain communication uh, between different vessels um, without being exceedingly loud ourselves. Um, it's definitely uh, a massive safety issue for us when we lose communication with our crews. And the only time that that happens is when the volume of other boats is too loud. And then we aren't able to safely maintain, uh, you know, communication to keep all of our crews in the same stretch of river uh, and safely off to our own side so that other people can use the rest of the river. Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen or Stephen Franklin. Stephen Franklin. Okay. Just, and, just remind folks star six. Star six. Okay. Star six. Star six to unmute yourself, please. Hello? Okay, we'll move on and come back to that one. Mary Baumgart Baumgarten. Gardner, sorry. Mary, are you on the line? Star six to unmute yourself, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Mary Baumgardner, and I'm a Westland City Councilor. I will not um, repeat some of the well-stated support for the reduction in the noise um, decibel limit, only just to say that I am in support of this re noise reduction to, for all the reasons stated um, for safety, um, livability, and for the 
natural habitat protections and that I believe it is not necessary for people to be able to enjoy the river and share it. Um, they can still do that if we do have this reduction in the noise volume limit. So I appreciate your allowing me to speak today and hope that that can be supported by the Marine Board. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Mary. And Scott Cliff. Scott Cliff, star six to unmute yourself. Okay, Scott, we're going to we're going to move on and we'll come back to you again if you're there. Tracy Marks. Tracy Hi, Marks. Tracy Marks. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, this is Tracy Marks. I'm president of the Wyndham Oaks neighborhood association of only eight homes three of which are on the river i am not my house is next to one of those homes um uh, we bought our home in 2017 um and we bought it one of the reasons was because of the eagles mini eagle nests blue heron flocks that would fly over those things are not happening anymore shortly after we purchased our home the um noise level down from the river echoes up and it is deafening. Um, my hearing has actually gotten worse since we have lived at this home. I never had bad hearing before. I actually am to a point of wearing earplugs when I'm outside. The noise is so loud we can't have barbecues in our backyard because we can't hear each other talk. I um, this goes on from sometimes seven in the morning until sometimes 10 o'clock at night. This is also going to make it hard for people to sell their homes. Um, but one thing I want to say is all of my neighbors are being terrorized by this new <coughs> level. Um, and if you look at, like, for instance, Miracle Ear, which is a very well known hearing aid company, if you talk to an audi audiologist like I have, 85 decibels or above causes permanent hearing loss. This could be causing hearing loss in children who play outside in the summer. Um, this could be really a pretty big deal um, for people who, you know, are live either on or even close to the river. Um, we would like the decibel level to be lower um, just to the West Coast standards, just as the prior person had stated. Um, everyone in the neighborhood um, of my neighborhood um, feels the same way. And um, I do want to thank all of you for your time. Um, and please, please consider uh, lowering the decibel limit. You're welcome to come to my house for a barbecue Tracy. and hear the noise. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. And next we have David Marks. Good morning, David Marks, uh, Westland resident also. Uh, just uh, try not to repeat what other people have said. I want to confirm you can't hear me, is that correct? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, uh, I do support lowering the decibel level to the common standard of 75 decibels for the needs of both the shoreline residents and the recreational watercraft users of all kinds, including kayaks. And I'm a kayak user, that's how I use the water. Um, but I'm not on the shoreline, uh, but I'm you know, in a neighborhood uh, that's off of the shoreline, but the noise level is incredible. Um, you know, I think in addition to that, you know, being able to have all watercraft enjoy the water is very important. 
uh, I have noticed in the different parks along the lower Willamette, which I visited more so this year, just trying to get a gauge of what it's like versus last year. There's a lot more families there without all the noise since you've had the restriction. So that's good to see. Um, the noise typically coming from the watercraft is just limited to one or two watercraft in the area for a long period of time in a, just one particular area. This is what I experienced not only in lower Willamette, but throughout Oregon. That pretty much ruins it for everybody else. So again, I try not to repeat myself. I do, or repeat what the people have said, I do support just the common standard of 75 decibels. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, we have Paige Stoyer. Paige, are you on the line? Unmute yourself with star six. Yeah, I see that. I see the eight three zero. Paige? Star six to unmute yourself. We should be able to hear you now. You're unmuted. But we can't. Sorry, Paige, we'll come back to you, okay? We'll come back to you. Okay, Stan Connison. Is Stan on the line? Stan, star six to unmute yourself. Okay, we're gonna move on. I'll come back to these. Doug Ronju. Doug, are you on the line? I assume Hello? you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Chair Early and members of the Marine Board, thank you for accepting our comments today. My name is Doug Romju, and I'm president of the Columbia River Yachting Association, representing member clubs and organizations where recreational boating is our passion. I'm also the secretary for WU, as well as a avid boater and offshore fisherman. There are many opportunities to recreate on Oregon waterways and opportunities for improvements on the water and beaches of our state waterways. Recent trends on the water include illegal camping, anchoring, and beaching of vessels around these waterfront camps, as well as trash and shopping carts. The boats keep coming, but they never leave, and soon become abandoned and derelict vessels. The camps get moved on a regular basis, but not the sunken or abandoned vessels. This means more area continues to be left unsafe to use. That process is very consistent, but the cleanup is not. That is our goal today, funding programs to remove these vessels from our waterways. Many member clubs are choosing to avoid cruise destinations to or near these problem areas. And River Place City Docks is a perfect example. A beautiful destination in the past for club cruises is now avoided due to safety concerns around illegally moored and anchored vessels that and the fear of an abandoned vessel breaking loose and damaging our boats. We support, a, we support a boat turn in program, almost for sure the least amount of money spent to contain the problem and it's gone well in the past. So uh, please consider that as one of the tools to use. Senator Taylor gave us a great gift to start this process of removing vessels, but we have to look at ways to keep funding at levels to get ahead of the problem. The ADV budget is not even close to the needs of our state to clean up all these messes. It needs to be increased to at least $500,000 to give some meaningful ability to look for solutions for vessel removal. 
We are all in this together. We love our waterways and what they bring to our lives. Let's do everything we can to protect it and bring back the beauty as well. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Ron Schmidt. We can hear you. And uh, I just got an on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Good morning, Chair Early, members of the board and Director Warren. I am Ron Schmidt. I am a floating homeowner, a paddle boarder, a rower, and a small to nine ton power boat cruiser living in Portland, Oregon. I'm also president of the Waterfront Organizations of Oregon. I'm delighted with the working relationship that we have between the OSMB and WU and want to comment on our ability to work together for common purposes. Um, other officers of WU, including Doug Ramsu and hopefully Stan Ponison, if we can get him on, are going to be speaking directly on specific issues of concern that we can work successfully together on, like we have so many other issues. Our organizations have complementary and supportive purposes. You can go to waterfrontoregon.com and see how they mirror. We have a great working relationship that we value and look forward to great accomplishments working together. I'd like to recognize Director Larry Warren, who has represented your board and agency so well. He has been available and responsive, and we appreciate him. Dorothy Deal, your policy program coordinator, is very involved, active, and proactive in working with us, and we appreciate her involvement in our common goals. There are many others within the agency on names who we appreciate and value. Of all the issues and goals the OSMB and WU have, the abandoned derelict vessels is a prominent challenge. Uh, you're going to hear more about that. We're going to work together on that. But I would add that we are very concerned about the financial catastrophe ADVs floating into private docks and marinas can be. We ask that the small families and small businesses be protected along with the state's deep pockets when promulgating funding for ADV removal. We are excited about the future of Oregon's waters, waterfront, and boating opportunities and we commit to working side by side with you and the entire OSMB to make that future bright. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we have a couple of people that are in person. Uh, next on the list is Peggy McCormick. Peggy, are you here? No. OK. OK, and on the line, uh, we have Jim. Is Jim on the line? I apologize, we do not have a last name. Uh, Jim Velasquez, by chance? I only have one Jim on the list, so it must be you. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity, at least. Uh, yes, um, I'm Jim Velasquez, and I've lived on by the river for at least 25 years. And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've had one person that's uh, more or less abused the noise audience on, it, on the river here. And I find it interesting that uh, everyone seems to be in agreement on this noise ordinance, except for the boat seller, uh, this Matt Krauser, I do believe his name was, and how he used equitable uh, quality of time for everybody involved on it. But he's not taking into consideration that there's very few people that abuse it and all those people on the shoreline that are trying to enjoy life with their families or come to the to beat the heat which everybody's done in the last couple of years they can no longer enjoy the river because of a few people abusing the situation on that and i find that that he has a uh, an equitable um I guess stake in this. So he's selling jet skis, and that's the only objection he has on it is that he wants to sell more jet skis rather than than uh, have the quality of life on the river that we've enjoyed for so many years. And also, I think that it's it's interesting that uh, we spent so much money into, as everybody's brought up, uh, the the quality of life for the wildlife. 
you know, like uh, Goat Island across here is, you know, a, a sanctuary for blue heron. And now they're leaving it because of the, the noise from the jet skis. So it's all this investment that we put into the, the community that's been wasted or is being wasted because of some irresponsible individuals with their equipment trying to abuse the waterways. Uh, and I'll keep it short, you know, because it seems like everybody's in agreement except for this one person uh, that the noise ordinance should be changed. So I will cut it off at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jennifer, do you need a spelling on his name? Uh, no, thank, you. Okay. thank you. OK, uh, we have uh, in person here is Deborah Vieira here. OK, uh, we had um, our representative from this area, um, David Brock Smith, arrive. And so welcome to the Oregon State Marine Board meeting, Representative Smith. And would you like to say anything at this time? Certainly. Good morning, Chair. Uh, just speak from here. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, well, um, welcome to Go Beach and House District 1 um, to the Marine Board. Uh, we have a letter from our caucus. Uh, in your in your information, um, and my understanding is uh, you had a wonderful trip uh, on the jet boats yesterday, and uh, got to see one of the uh, largest economic drivers for Royal Beach. Um, I uh, will just keep it short. I'm sure you've heard a lot of testimony, uh, and that is to say, as I told the director when he. <laughs> When he uh, let me know that this was coming down the pipe, um, that uh, there's economic development that occurs across the state, but especially down here in, uh, in, in my neck of the woods, that um, this rulemaking uh, petition should be uh, denied. Um, and if there is a, a larger issue, we can take it up in the legislature itself rather than uh, through the Marine Board. And so I hope that uh, that. Um, that that is the case and that we move forward later today to uh, deny the petition and, and not move forward with rulemaking on this issue as it's um, not really an issue. It might be for one person or as you've heard or gathered some information now that uh, now that this has uh, been moving forward. Um, but there is a lot of, of our coastal uh, and communities across the state that uh, will be negatively impacted if, in fact, things were to move forward. And so I hope that you deny the petition. And I appreciate you being down here at Mill Beach and taking the field trip. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And, and Chair Ripley, just because I don't know how long he's going to stay at the risk of the ire of the chair, I just want to say that Representative Brock Smith is always a great conduit for voters in this area. And even if we don't agree on an issue, he's always respectful. We talk through it. And uh, he's just always somebody that supports the Marine Board at the legislature, which is very much appreciated from this area. Thank you, Director. I appreciate the work. I would second that, being in his district. So we're going to move back to the top of our list again now and uh, see if we can capture some of the people who signed up to testify. Uh, Everett Beasley. How about David Dickerson? Once again, you have to hit star six to unmute yourself. David Dickerson. Dickerson. Hello, yes, this is Dave Dickerson. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Well, um, my name is Dave Dickerson, and I represent the Personal Watercraft Industry Association, as well as the National Marine Manufacturers. Um, and I'm here in my two minutes to speak very firmly against uh, a call for the narrative standard as well as the proposed ban on freestyle type riding. Um, in regard to the narrative standard, there's, there's some legal issues that are, are far beyond the, a conversational one. On land, if the narrative standard were to be used to cite someone for noise at their home, at a party or something like that, it would result in a fine. If it's done on water, the OSMB is notified under 83270 of this noise violation charge, and that will result in that boat being pulled off the water until that boat can then come back and prove that it is within the noise uh, limit, the decibel noise limit, it is off the water. 
if you have a narrative standard which is tied to absolutely no criteria except the opinion of the officer on site, that leaves the boat, boater absolutely unable to get his boat back on the water because he simply has no factual basis on which to state that his boat does meet the criteria under the way the law, uh, pardon me, under the way the citation was presented, which is really not a violation of, 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 of the uh, state uh, noise standard at all. And so I encourage you not to approve such an arbitrary uh, requirement because it runs contrary to the way that the state law currently exists and the standards and operation procedures of the OSMB. Secondly, the idea of saying that a freestyle type riding should not occur anywhere in the state on any waterway under any circumstances is simply um, regulatory overreach and it is, it is totally unwarranted. Quite frankly, very few vessels of any type can perform the type of actions that are so offensive to everyone in regard to this one single individual that has been uh, talked about uh, not only on this meeting but in other presentations. David, you'll this need to a, wrap it up in two minutes. David, you'll need to wrap it up. Performed by very few, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We are Christian Celeron. Christian Celeron. Star six to unmute yourself if you are on the line. Christian. Okay. Stephen Franklin. Stephen Franklin, star six to unmute yourself. Scott Cliff. Scott Cliff. Paige Stoyer. Paige, are you on the line? Yes. Yes. We can hear you. You can? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me and uh, for circling back so that I could speak, especially I'm concerned after hearing that it seemed like it was only voting industry people who were against the petition. Um, so my name is Paige Stoyer, and I'm here on behalf of the Willamette River Community Coalition. And we want to share our opposition to the um, noise petition, most especially the narrative standard, um, because we're concerned about the ongoing attempts to unfairly regulate and restrict public use of our waterways. To those who have submitted the petition, we certainly understand your specific concerns regarding that mostly one jet skier who is exceeding um, the existing noise levels on a regular basis. But as stated by numerous river users, homeowners, and the State Sheriff's Association, it's just not appropriate to be seeking broad restrictions on an entire user group as laid out in the petition. Our group has over a thousand members just in our Facebook group and many more not on Facebook including many riverfront homeowners. And we believe that we're best served by working together as a community to solve issues when they come up. Um, you know, we can't keep fighting over every little thing and trying to restrict each other when somebody annoys us. Um, and we have to remember that none of us have more right to be on the waterways than somebody else. Um, if you live or recreate on the river, you'll have to understand that it will at times be very busy and it will be noisy at times because many other people are also enjoying the river in a wide variety of activities. Um, you know, the constant complaints from a small number of homeowners seem to be trying to change the nature of our river. And it's kind of like moving to a, a golf course and then complaining when golf balls end up in your yard. When there are real issues that come up at times, our river and boating community definitely want to try to work together on these. And we've always been willing to sit down any time to discuss these issues. We've worked really hard to try to bring people together and we'd like to see much more collaborative and inclusive efforts on these issues. Like we recently saw at Lake Billy Chinook, 
one of our members helped to lead that cooperative effort. Um, and he also had tried to do the same thing here on the Willamette River. But as we know, those more inclusive. Paige, and, oh, yes. You'll need to wrap it up, please. Your oh. time is up. So those inclusive and collaborative efforts here were just not supported by the Marine Board. So um, we would like to ask the Marine Board to, to reject this petition and instead to take a stand to protect public access and recreation on our waterways. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Stan Tonneson. Stan. I'm here. Good morning, Stan. We can hear you. Great. Good morning, um, Chair Early and members of the Marine Board. My name is Stan Tonneson, and I own Rocky Point Marina in Portland with my wife, Jen, who served on the Marine Board from 2011 to 2019. I am very active in the Metro Marina and Floating Home Community and have served on many agency groups, committees, boards representing our waterfront community. In 2021, I introduced Senate Bill 740, which would have added a $5 fee per biennium to all boat registrations in Oregon to generate approximately $750,000 every two years for ADV removal. The bill took some twists and turns and ultimately Senator Taylor fulfilled her promise to get a one-time million dollars to clean up the ADVs in the Willamette where much of her district is. Our group of three that spoke today um, are in discussion with Senator Taylor's office to discuss permanent funding options for ADV removals. I have spoken with two state agencies that are working on substantial funding for removal of ADV commercial vessels. Recreational vesicle, vessels are also included. To quote one agency's recent report to the governor, quote, the task force indicated approximately $1 million to $5 million would be needed annually to remove new ADVs once the historic backlog of legacy vessels is addressed. These costs could be reduced through prevention and other programs outlined within the task force recommendation for ADV program development, unquote. The Oregon State Marine Board does not increase their ADV budget of $150,000 per biennium in well over 10 years. And when there, and when there were only a dozen ADVs. The current estimate is 175 ADVs. The only additional money that the Oregon State Marine Board has received were grants from NOAA several years ago, and again the past two years, that were $100,000 each year for a boat turning program that is somewhat restrictive, but extremely effective, but only makes a tiny dent in the overall problem. My request to the board is that you direct the Oregon State Marine Board to initiate legislation to increase the ADV funding by a minimum of $500,000 for both the removal of ADVs and expansion of the very successful boat turn-in program. Thank you thank for you, your Sam. thoughtful consideration. I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Okay, that concludes our public comment uh, for the people who had signed up um, and were on the line, and also for those that um, signed up to be here in person and were not here. So we are going to move on to our agenda oh, right now. Oh, sure, may oh. I interrupt just one moment? Okay. On, on this issue, a lot of excellent testimony there. I'm glad you're the law enforcement would be exempted or in this proposal. Uh, locally, uh, very concerned for our fishing guides, and I assume that there would be, this would go into effect, it would be a transitional period. Um, I want to speak just a little bit about wildlife. I uh, ran tour boat my first year in 1972, so about 50 years. Um, no studies that I'm aware of, nor have I ever experienced a negative impact, not even the bears, you know, on uh, the, the, the tour boats or the private boats. So I don't think that's an issue. And then uh, one other thing, uh, we have a long-standing tradition here, almost 65 years of uh, racing on our waterways throughout Southern Oregon and to be in Northern California. So I just would want to make sure that's exempted. And finally, I agree with uh, Representative Brock Smith that uh, this is probably best uh, addressed in the legislature and uh, 
would like to see that uh, move forward. Thank you very much for your time and also for your service. Thank you, Commissioner Boyce. Okay, so once again, uh, we are going to conclude our public comment period and we will move on to our agenda items now. And so first up on our agenda is the director's agency report. So Director Warren. Sure. Uh, Chair, early members of the board, uh, just a few things and then take any questions. Uh, Want to echo the thanks that Chair Early gave to all the folks involved in getting us out on the water. And then in particular, we do our jet boat training down here every year pretty much. Uh, and uh, Sheriff Ward and the community really opens up the doors for us. Sheriff Ward really makes sure that that happens and it's just great to see the community support that so well. So thank you, Sheriff. And I uh, want to um, introduce our new registration manager. I told him today he gets away with the princess wave. So Andrew, if you just want to stand up back there so the board can get a look at you. Um, Andrew replaced uh, Janice who retired earlier this year and he comes with a wealth of experience from the DMV and some private sector call center work and is just impressing me more every day with his ability to to do things that we didn't even know possible with our systems. And then I'm actually going to just real briefly ask her to come up just so she can actually introduce herself. So Amber, if you want to make your way up, we'll, we'll put you center stage. So folks probably don't know, we're too small of an agency to have our own human resource um, person. So I thought it would be good for the board to know we contract for that service with Department of Administrative Services. And for the past two years, I think I've written in the contract that if they take Amber away from us, I'm, I want to tear the contract up because she does such amazing work. So she works with other boards and commissions and agencies. So I thought it would be good for the board to just know who she is face and then she could just briefly tell you what she does in the agency. Good morning, Chair Early and members of the board. Um, as Director Warren said, I'm the HR business partner at DAS. So I have multiple DAS uh, units and I also have other my agencies, Board of Accountancy, I work with mental health, regulatory agency. So it does give me kind of another idea of how other boards work and how they kind of um, get information from their director. So most of my work goes into working with the staff and the managers as far as providing guidance with personnel issues, training, recruitments. Um, but I also am uh, supposed to be a resource for the board when they have need kind of a conduit between them and the director or um, for kind of the appraisal evaluation time of the director. I can work with stakeholders to get surveys out, that kind of information. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me as a resource. Um, if there's trainings that you want to, to see if we're even uh, available for the director or um, agency staff, I can help uh, put those things together or lose track it down. So, and I would also like to echo what a lot of people have said and um, Marine Board has actually been my, my favorite uh, board to work with. I think I've worked with 11 so far and they are by far professional top-notch employees I'm very impressed with uh, the staff of the Army board so well thank you Amber and welcome yeah, thank yes thanks, and thanks for joining our law enforcement training yesterday we noticed that you jumped right in yes, <laughs> yes. Right. If, you're, if you're gonna be have a client agency you gotta be all in yes yeah. Yeah. thanks Amber thank appreciate it and, and Amber does a really nice job of making herself available to staff too. I know staff are very comfortable reaching out and talking to her. She's just a really great contracted resource for us. Well, before you move on from the yeah. administration part of things, because I know that we had a retirement within the agency, a uh, longtime employee within the um, within the voting facilities. And so um, I know a little bit of uh, Janine's right hand person is is leaving. And so I wanted to present Jennifer Peterson with a coin for her dedication and service to Oregon voters and for keeping things running within the registration. So um, Jennifer, thank you very much. This is this is a coin for you from the board here. And then I would like to present one other coin at this time, and that is for uh, retiring uh, Coos, Coos County Sheriff uh, Deputy, that is Will Coleman, who has been instrumental in helping with all of our uh, law enforcement trainings from academy to, um, to, to drift, to jet, 
Um, he is affectionately called the not Nazi. And having been through his not school, I can tell you that he is very specific, but he is also an incredible instructor and he will be very well missed. So uh, I will present this to Will tomorrow morning as well. But um, in addition to having a bar on the Rogue River now for uh, him, he will now have a coin from the agency. So I'll hang on to it. You, I'm yeah. give it to him tomorrow. I was going to say, so. you'll see him before we will. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so, Director Warren, thank you for that interruption. Yes. So at this time, I think the only other thing that's probably changed since I put this together was we we had a little warm up in the valley right after I wrote this. And so we have had some of the conflicts return on the river that we would expect when it's 100 degrees out and a whole lot of people in the valley hit the Willamette River and staff's just doing a great job of handling those. Uh, we did unfortunately have a fatality that made quite a bit of news, just a really rare situation where a operator was pulling a tuber, made a hard turn back and ran over his own tuber. The media didn't necessarily always convey that real well. Sometimes they made it sound like it was two different entities that had that fatality. So tough situation, really difficult for all those involved and just an unfortunate situation. So, Yeah, condolences to the family because it was definitely um, a very difficult situation. Yes. Yeah. So we happen to take any questions. Comments or questions on the director's report? Really appreciated a lot of the social media that has been going out that that's been been really good. Um, it particularly uh, in, enjoyed and appreciated reading about keeping Meg's memory alive with the life jacket loaner station. I know that there have been quite a few people that have been working on additional loaner stations throughout the state, including down here in Curry County. So uh, that was a that was a very well crafted message that got out there, as well as the opportunities and access reports that are going out on a regular basis now. I got one again this morning. <laughs> and so those are those are really nice because it gives a, a little synopsis and uh, especially appreciate when it says new or update. <laughs> well, on that note, I would say um, I think the, the bulk of the credit probably goes to Janine Black on that one, but I know she also has involved Josh and, and Brian in the backup and they work together on that. And, um, it's been something we've been trying and it's just been picked up really well and we've gotten good feedback and I think even Fish and Wildlife talked about picking it up and helping us propagate it. So really nice for people to know what's going on, especially as the water levels change and construction projects happen. So. And just one more comment uh, regarding the ADD. Um, appreciated the people who uh, came online today to make some comments about that. Um, that's been with the million dollars that, that we got from the legislature. Uh, that's going to be a priority. Um, it's our understanding that we will be able to partner with some of the other agencies within the state to be able to maybe increase that amount. So we'll, I'm sure, hear more about that within the budget. Um, I'd also like to comment about the opportunity access report. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who are recreational paddlers that they're finding it as a great resource to, hey, you know, we're somewhere new we can go this weekend yeah. or this week. Um, I also want to thank Director Warren for the participation of the Marine Board in Big Float, which, while it's not necessarily a boating activity, it made the agency a lot more visible and is part of the Makes Memories um, program. Uh, quite a few life jackets were given out primarily to youth and, and smaller children so that those who were participating in the event had properly fitting child size life jackets. So thanks for the opportunity for the board to participate in that activity and make us a little more visible. Great. And I understand, Member Jackson, you got to participate in towing a pink swan that was bigger than the agency boat at some point. And <laughs> that is true. And there are pictures to prove it. Okay, any other comments on the director's report? I don't have any comments or questions. Okay. All right, so uh, next up on the list here is, um, let me see what time it is right now. Um, I know. So um, we're going to go ahead and move into um, the agency mission, vision, and values report. Um, and that is Director Warren. I think we, I believe we have a PowerPoint presentation as well.
and we're getting those PowerPoints um, up right now, so it'll be just a minute. Okay. Well, luckily the rest of the slideshows you see today um, are really cool and lots of colors. So mine's just a nice plain black and white, a little monochromatic. So one day I'll learn how to put all the colors and razzle dazzle in there. Um, so I wanted to talk with the board briefly this morning about mission, vision, and values. I think it's important sometimes to step back and remember why we're here. I know member with the often reminds us, you know, when we're doing our rulemaking, what is the underpinning for that? And I would I would say the underpinning should be our mission, vision, values. And so wanted to update the board on some of the things we've been doing as staff around that work. So um, the first thing this morning is our mission statement. And like any other good government mission statement, it's way too long. Nobody can remember it and it can drive a Mack truck through it. And if Ashley was here, I would ask her to recite it because she's the only person who can do it from memory. And this was put together, I think, about 10 years ago with a whole lot of public outreach, consultants, the whole nine yards. And so a few years ago when managers started working on how we were going to rework some of this, we, we looked at this and we thought, you know what, we could spend a whole lot of time and energy reworking all this and probably come up with something that was still pretty true to this. This is what we do. This this describes um describes what we do so we we have suggested that we should just leave the mission in place it's serving oregon recreational boating public education enforcement access and environmental stewardship for a safe and enjoyable experience so this mission has been our mission for about a decade and we're just suggesting we continue on with this as our mission uh the vision is one that um those that are the historians the last vision that we came up with again as part of that outreach process was a collaborative community providing opportunities for all boaters to safely and respectfully experience Oregon waterways. And as we worked with some of our public and we worked with our manager groups and staff, uh, we came up with just a new a new vision, which is the boaters benefit as Marine Board navigates change and growth of waterway use. And this is something that I hope you see already and how we're approaching things as we're getting out to new things, as we're trying to get involved with new groups and really get out there and look at what's coming in the future, get ahead of some things. This is where we're hoping this vision drives us more than the vision that we had been sitting with for a decade. So um, got that vision in peace in place. And then this is the area values for an organization. I always say whenever there's friction inside of an organization, it's almost always about different applications of values and um, you see that show up. I always use one of the simplest explanations I can I can always think of is like around financial stewardship type things. I might think it's good to not spend any money. Val might think it's good to invest money in people and resources and things. We both think we're being good financial stewards, but but we both think each other's doing it wrong. And so um, when we worked on these value statements as a management group and when we've worked with staff, these are updated value statements. We really talk about it's the discussions and the things that we're having around those values and how we talk about them as we make our decisions that's more important than the words on the paper. Because again, they kind of get lengthy and things like that. But one, one I want to call out really is just the top one on the transparency for the board is there's a lot of times where it would be a lot easier for us to do some of these things in ways that weren't always publicly transparent. Uh, but we'd be violating some rules. Um, even, even when we can, why would we? And so I think for the board around transparency, it's what we're doing today, hearing from the public, listening to difficult conversations. Uh, I think we've got hundreds of pages of public comment for this meeting. You know, when we operate transparently, that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna hear from people and we should invite that and want that. Uh, trust and credibility is a big one. You know, the one that I'll call out on this is um, voting. You know, in a traditional sense, voting is obviously not a value. We've had that internal debate way too many times. We're going to stop debating it. Uh, but this is really a reminder that while we can't require everyone who works for the Marine Board or be involved on the Marine Board to own a boat, we really should be interested in boats. We are the boating organizations and we have a lot of partner agencies that do a lot of amazing things that we, we work with. Oregon's a federated model where we all work together in, in small silo agencies. Um, or smaller siloed agencies and say one big Department of Natural Resource. 
And our piece of that puzzle is Bodie. And I think it's easy for us sometimes to forget that and get tied up into some of the things that our partner agencies take care of. So this is just a good reminder for us that that's why we're here. And last piece, and then just any questions that the board might have on this, and then I'll talk about next steps, is, you know, I've really thought a lot about, and I didn't think I still articulated it very well in the write-up. One of the things that I think is different about a board than staff, Staff, you really want everybody driving to one objective, one, you know, really lockstep in the boat, going in the same direction, using their their differences for strengths. I think with the board, one of the challenges that you face sometimes when you feel some of your own tension is really you're all here because you have a different background, you bring a different strength, you bring different ideas, and, and that's okay. It's not, it's not a, we don't want you all thinking like one, we want you working together. But I think the board would short itself if we try to do it like we do with staff, where we really try to coalesce around one idea and one way of doing things and getting somewhere. So I think with the board, you have to be comfortable that you're you're going to approach some of these things differently, but you're really just all trying to serve the same purpose. So I wanted to call that out for the board. I'll take any questions and then just talk about kind of next next steps with this piece. Uh, member with me. Lo and behold, I have a question. All right. We are, public, we are a public service uh, agency. As a public service agency, I think it's important for us to understand who our customers are and who the stakeholders are. Now, the question is, obviously, our customers uh, are voting public in Oregon. Are our customers also all Oregon citizens, whether they vote or not? How do we consider, how do we consider all that in evaluating all these issues as they come up, you know, like the one we're talking about now, the board, board notice. Obviously, that has impacts on Oregon citizens who aren't Oregon voters. Do we represent them as well as the Oregon voters? And where's the balance look? And member with you, that's, that's a great question that we have had. And, you know, you're making Josh's day right now. He's probably antsy back there wanting to come up and, and have this discussion. It's it's a discussion we've had a long time, right? Is our everything from is our job to get out there and try to get or, every Oregonian to own a boat? Is that is that what we should be doing? Like, I think it'd be great. Um, although then the launch lines would get longer. But, you know, are we doing that kind of outreach to people that aren't voters? In terms of the policy dis discussions, I think, when I think about what I think you're asking there is we for a long time, I think sometimes would ignore some of the non-voting public. And we see that that didn't work with some of the legislations and things that came up, right? So I think about we're here for the voters. That's our mission. That's why we exist. We also have some environmental stewardship pieces. So the way that I think it would be healthy for the organization to think about the non-voting public is how are voters impacting that? And sometimes, unfortunately, that does maybe require us to regulate voters in certain situations so that we can protect voting. I mean, it's tough to say that you regulate to protect because sometimes you might need a rule so that people can keep voting in an area. But I also think rules aren't our only tool. Josh will talk some more about that later on in his pieces. So it's that education and outreach. It's bringing groups together. And so the way I think we serve the non-voting public, while they're not necessarily a direct customer of ours, we should always be tr serving the voter, but we do unintentionally serve non-voters by recognizing their opinions and voices as we think about voting regulations, policy, education, outreach. But it, it, is, a, it is a difficult philosophical question, and I bet if we went around the room, not everybody would hit the same answer on that. Why not, uh, You said, uh, Oregon citizens aren't necessarily our direct customers. Uh, can you pursue that? You know, I think as a public service organization uh, and a state organization, I would think all citizens are our customers. So, member with you, I think all citizens have the potential to be a customer. I think, and again, I think we serve all Oregonians by having a good, healthy, well-regulated recreational boating industry and okay. guide industry. So I think we serve all Oregonians in that way by by having a good, positive recreational boating community out there that's that's doing good things and being safe and well-educated and operating in good manners. Um, I, you know, again, we, we've had uh, our last 
managers meeting where we talked about some of our strategic planning, we, we had a very robust conversation about what our role is in outreach and trying to get, do, are we out trying to recruit new voters or are we working with organizations that are trying to do that? Ah, but where's our piece on that? So it is a, so again, I, that's the way I would think about it. But again, I, I certainly think you get different opinions. from. Well, you know, I think it's a very important discussion to have among the board for us to come to some understanding of the role we play and all that. Uh, let me go a little further. Voting. Define who's a voter. You know, you have floating homes, you've got paddle boards, you've got kayaks. Yeah. That's, that's a whole range of uh, activities. Sure. And some are included and some are in our regulation. Can you kind of define that a little better? So remember, with the when we started this journey a couple of years ago as managers, we were we were all still talking non-motorized, motorized paddlers, oars, rowers, all those things, and we we were pretty intentional about wanting to coalesce around boaters and really do the work to try to help everybody understand that if they're on a stand-up paddleboard, which I know that's the hardest one, kayaks, rafters, power boaters, sailboaters, um, they're all boaters, and we're all part of a community, and so. Um, I think where we probably struggle is, you know, some of the real gray areas where you get some of the pool floaty toys, but then they tie two of those together. So now they're a boater. But if they untie them, they're not. The, the floating swan, was that a pool toy or was that a boat? I don't know. It was huge. It was amazing. Um, but, you know. And it had multiple chambers. <laughs> right. And it had multiple chambers. So it was a boat. Um, so I think that's the way that we really wanted to think about this was really trying to help stop trying to divide everybody in this motorized non-motorized plus i think there's people that only do non-motorized there's people that only do motorized but i think there's more and more people that are a blend you just see so many people that seem to have a little bit of everything in their garage which is great they've got a couple kayaks and they've got a power boat maybe a drift boat and a, i'm going through valves list right <laughs> <laughs> that's right now <laughs> yeah. taking away and, it at all and so I think that's the challenge before the agency is, is helping everybody understand they're part of the voting community instead of continuing to draw this bright line between the two types. Well, I think also you need to you need to recognize that not only somebody who owns a boat ha is a voter, but you have people who utilize the people who have boats, yes. such as myself. I mean, I get passengers, they don't own a boat, but they spend a lot of time boating because they'll sit in my boat. They understand boats, they, and so you've got that contingent also. You've got those people who don't own a boat, but maybe they go rent a boat. You've got the people who get on the jet boats to go enjoy, to recreate, to be able to do that. And so th those are all people that are part of our circle. Yeah, that's where we come into the being representative of all Oregon citizens, because as uh, Bill says, Oregon citizens participate on the water in various activities, whether they're spectators or active boat operators, you know. So I think it's important that we consider everybody's viewpoint and trying to promote voting across the state. Uh, opportunities. Opportunities, right. Stakeholders. If you could talk about that a little bit, you know, we have a lot of people with interest. They have a stake in uh, voting activities like mm -hmm. the folks in the legislature, like councilman, like uh, the commissioner. Uh, it's important for us to recognize, I think, that they're stakeholders and we need to consider their perspective and viewpoints. And uh, whenever we're looking at a voting issue, we need to take those into consideration somehow and find some balance. Do you agree with that? And, Oh, of course, member Withy, and and I would add, you know, we could we could list them all off, but don't forget all of those partner agencies that I talked about, the DSLs, the DEQs, the o ODFW. I mean, still most of our boaters are still um, anglers and hunters, and so you know, huge stakeholders and partners in what we do. We have federal partners that we work with, and, uh, so interest in all those. So you know, it's hard for us to identify all who the, who they are and make sure they're included as we consider these issues. Um, so I think that's where the transparency, the trust and the credibility come into play, though, because, it, it, you know, we have seen an increase in the number of people that are participating in our public comment and our, you know, when we request public comment and then also even just in testifying at a meeting. 
we've seen a big increase in that. And, and I think it's not just because of contentious issues. I think it's because we are soliciting more participation. So I think that's important. But as a board member, I, I try to weigh how we uh, address that, how we consider their input versus trying to promote the voting. Sure. So that is a challenge. It is, Member Withing. I, I can't recall his slide deck right offhand, so Josh may get into some of this a little later in his rulemaking. He's given me a, a yes. Um, so I would just add that, um, you know, one of the things that I think probably is also difficult for, for the board particularly is depending on those stakeholders that you mentioned, um, some of them like to give us some input, but they don't necessarily, they've got their own challenges, right? They've got their own constituents or people that vote for them or um, agencies that have their own relationship with a different organization. So sometimes we get that feedback and information and um, and we use it in the staff and how we come and prepare and provide information. Uh, but um, I, I would suspect when Josh is done, you'll see we, we get a lot of information from a lot of sources and sometimes it's public or somebody shows up and, and says, yep, I'm going to talk on the record today. And other times it's just a phone call to say, hey, by the way, I'm interested in this. Could you let me know what the outcome is? And so, again, we've got stakeholders all over and they're, they're trying to balance and maintain all their relationships and, and challenges as well. I'd like to explore a little bit of, I don't want to dominate all this conversation, but I'd like to explore a little bit the difference between the board and the staff and what the staff does versus what the board's role is. Could you expand upon that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, at a, at a very functional level, um, and again, I know Josh is going to talk about some of this very specific to rulemaking, so I'm not going to talk just about the rulemaking. I'll talk about the big pieces. Um, I think the board's here to represent a cross-section of Oregon voters and communities and different backgrounds and to help guide the rulemaking and the policy making and the budget and the expenses. And then the staff is kind of the operational side. We're, we're putting that all into, into play and doing the day-to-day -day work, so to speak. So I think that'd be the most basic way I'd describe that division. You know, in your experience with me, I put in a lot of my own time to sure. investigate the issues. I I want to be informed when I take a vote. I want to know all the ins and outs. Sometimes that goes beyond what work the staff does. Uh, sometimes that causes some concern and some conflict. Uh, but that's how I function and operate. And I guess, as you say, uh, I'm different maybe in my approach than other folks. And I guess that's uh, part of being a diverse organization. Right. Uh, but sometimes I'm wondering if I'm stepping on toes or I shouldn't be, if I'm going beyond, if I'm going beyond my role as a board member. Uh, I don't know if there's a question in that, it's more of a statement. Well, the way I've always looked at the, at the staff is the staff is there to answer questions for the board because the board should be asking questions. So the, the, they are our resource. They are the ones that are going to find the answers for us. If those answers are, are not quite as far as we want, we can work with the staff to be able to do that. We can do our own investigations and find out additional information. Um, I think that it's important to, for the, the, my opinion, it's, it's important for the board to utilize staff because they are our resource. And, and that's who we depend on. But being an independent board, we also have to put all these little pieces together um, along with the Oregon voters and, and what the staff brings and make decisions based on those. And that's that's the way I look at it. The board is kind of the oversight, but staff does, does all of the day-to-day -day work because we're not supposed to be in the minutia of the everyday. So we just need to understand everything that's going on and we you know, need to be fiscally responsible as well. So, so what you're saying, I agree with you, our responsibility is to be informed. And we have to do that using the staff, but also independently. So when we make a decision, when we take a vote, 
it is the best vote that we can make considering all the aspects of the issue. Um, I see that my, as my role on the board. I'm not sure how others view it, but uh, that's how I see my role. I would agree, but I would also add, what is your personal filter? Because my perspective of voting is more like from that non-motorized Portland competitive sports urban viewpoint where Chair Early's is, a, you know, a completely different angle of what is voting. While she respects what I do, her expertise and knowledge and passion and for lack of a better term, constituency is something completely different. So like on many of the issues that we've had, we get some public comments. A particular comment might speak to me a lot more than it might speak to somebody else. Um, you know, and so I might see some kind of little factor statistic or something in there. I probably won't bother Josh with the dive on that. I'll go dive into that myself and, and look into like, what does this really mean or where is this coming from? Or is this really what the law says in the state of Tennessee or somewhere? Um, you know, so like, again, the minutia I might take care of, but some of the bigger pictures of like, so am I reading this correctly, Josh, that this, 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 and this is happening in our neighboring states? Things like that. So it's kind of, um, you know, I will dive into stuff that really speaks to me. But again, the big picture, I kind of take turf back to the staff. Well, I think your point is that, you know, we all have different experiences and I think that that's really important. And that's what director was saying, you know, that's what makes our board, makes the board diverse is, is that the difference in the, the experiences and we shouldn't all be cookie cutter the same. And member with you, I would share that I think everybody should gather information in a way that's best for them and that again staff 100 percent is a resource um i think if i was just to say some of the challenges where you might have felt like you were were stepping on toes as you as you said is some of those stakeholder agencies when you start reaching out directly to some of those we have we have complicated relationships with some of our stakeholders and or we're aware of some of their political challenges that they face and and we try to balance that again one of the complicated good or bad Oregon works in that federated model where we have interlocking but not overlapping authorities and that takes um some some political dancing with the at the agency level as we work with each other to make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes and so sometimes the way we interact with agencies is based on that long term relationship or understanding their challenges. You know, you know, we might know a particular agency has a really difficult political issue in an area and we can respect and understand why they're going to show up differently when we ask them for information. And, and so, again, it's use this as a resource, but definitely go out and do any of the research and information you want. But I. I've shared in the past, I think you'd be surprised how much information gathering everyone else does as well. Yeah. There's one other area I'd like to uh, discuss or explore. That's oh, outreach. Please. And I, I didn't see you in the values here. Uh, I really appreciate recently the outreach I've seen in uh, some of these programs trying to bring in uh, more diversity yeah, reaching out to minority groups or other ethnic groups. Uh, I would see that as a critical mission of the board. And uh, our new member, I think, is key to that. Uh, so I would like to include that some way or somehow in our values or our mission. I think that's important. And, and member with you, that's where we get into that diversity and inclusion statement. And and I would just share that I, you know, I think it's important for everybody to be involved in that outreach, and not just one particular board member. And um, to that end, when the governor was was working with some of her funding teams around racial justice and equity, they needed agencies to volunteer. And I knew we could volunteer without. A problem because we were doing the work. We we don't need to make something up. We don't have to tell a story. And sure enough, you know, we were one of the test 26 agencies that are working with some of the some of the environmental equity committees and whatnot to put our budget together. And um, it, it's been great. We've we've actually grown even more from from that experience. But it's been a, an example where we just talk about what we're doing, and we're proud of that. And 
and, and we need to continue to do that. So I think you know one of our values is we're trying to grow our community, our voting community by uh, those efforts. I think this is a very good dis uh, discussion. I think it's something that we uh, uh, all should value having on occasion. So we have the same foundation. So I appreciate you uh, bringing this up in the meeting. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Anybody else? OK, so what's next? Next steps. Oh, next. Oh, yeah. What's next? I'm like, the agenda. Yeah, <laughs> what's next step? Next step. So next step. Your next slide. So we've got, uh, oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, board discussion. We had that. So we are doing a series of public outreach meetings in October. We actually just booked the dates. And staff is going to go all over the place, um, northeast, southeast, middle, a um, couple around the Salem, Portland area. And we're going to do it just like we did it last time, where instead of just getting up and giving a speech, we're going to just have tables where people can come in and talk about what's interesting to them. So if they want to talk voting safety, facilities, policy, uh, some of our diversity and inclusion efforts, budget, uh, we'll just come in and have a conversation with them and we'll do like we did last time where we stayed as long as they wanted to. And some meetings were really well attended last time. Some folks came thinking they were coming for a different meeting and ended up in our meeting and stayed because it was so much fun to talk about voting. And so we're really going to start to talk about these mission vision values through those meetings, get more public outreach, and then just continue to do the staff engagement work so that, you know, again, we go for that line of sight in our organization where everybody knows what we're doing and where we're trying to get to and, and understands how their role is important to our agency being successful. Sounds exciting. Do we have any different send out those dates to board members who might want to attend? We we can. I'm sure yes. <laughs> if Josh will let it be I on our will, calendars. I will do it next week. It is on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I'll joke with Josh. So thank you. Yes. Okay. So um thank you, Director Warren very much Thank you. and uh, we will go ahead and deal with item C and then I believe we'll take a little break after that so oh, okay. uh, we are still no you're here we um, member Moran still has not joined us she is on there now okay you want to say welcome Colton oh, hi I'm here <laughs> sorry some technical difficulties that's okay Okay, so um, facilities uh, manager uh, Janine Bilek, thank you and welcome. Now we are uh, going to discuss the grant 1674 Douglas County Amherst Park. Thank you, Chair Lee. Members of the board, uh, Mark Wall is on the line with us. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Janine. Good morning, board. Uh, Mark is the Douglas County Parks Director, so the board had previously approved the Amaker Park project that is redoing all the paving as well as the upper portion of the boat ramp and a non-motorized maneuver area uh, to separate and reduce some conflict that happens during the busy season. Uh, we, the county received bids, they were very competitive and should be of no surprise, the cost of everything is rising. And in discussions with the county, um, they are proposing to increase their grant by $50,000 if we would as well. That will give us about $37,000 of contingency for any unforeseen items that may occur on this property. Mark, do you want to add anything? No, I think you've got it covered well. Um, some of the unanticipated costs was the uh, the Army Corps permit for this project that the project overlays a very uh, large uh, Native American uh, site and as a result of the Corps permit we're required to have an on-site archaeologist for all the excavation work and uh, that was a big contributor to the uh, the cost increases in addition to the the actual contract bid being a little bit higher than uh, than anticipated those, those are the two big drivers behind the cost increases and uh, want to see this project through. Uh, I don't anticipate um, a lot of other contingency expenses. Uh, inevitably, there are a few things that will come up, and so having that available funding uh, is good to have. 
um, in my discussions with Janine, uh, any contingency funds not spent would be equally shared. And so uh, the, the $50,000 commitment from the county and what we're asking from the board would be a uh, case scenario. Uh, more likely it'll be something less than that. So staff is recommending the board support this cost increase of $50,000 with the county matching it by $50,000. Are there any questions? How, how is this going to influence what grant funds we have left? So right now we uh, have basically obligated all of our waterway access grants. Um, so we will receive a few projects that will have some cost savings and I anticipate utilizing those through our small grant program. Since we increase the limit, it makes it a lot um, easier for nonprofits to be able to do some very great projects. Um, but we do have motorized money right now. We're sitting with about a million dollars for cycle three and press releases just went out on those. So $50,000 um, isn't much of a dent, but we anticipate a pretty robust cycle three. Um, I am anticipating bringing a project to the board in October because the materials delay is fairly significant and we need to purchase some docks if we're going to have a chance to hit an in-water work window. Yeah. Um, Take care of that. And I was down at, I was just there uh, a week ago or so, and, and it definitely, it's, it's needed. Yeah, it's needed. So to clarify, this project is funded both with waterway access funds and facility grant funds. Yes. And the 50,000 is going to be a mix. It will only be with the boating facility grant funds. There'll be no additional non-motorized funds that we will be contributing. Yeah. Well, I'll make a motion that the board approve cost increase to fifty thousand dollars in voting facility grant funds for the project uh, at uh, Douglas County. I have looking for a project number. Oh, it's grant sixteen seventy four. And I second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve uh, grant uh, sixteen seventy four cost increase. Um, $50,000 to match the $50,000. Uh, total project cost would be $862,000. And is there any additional discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. And good luck. OK, at this time, I believe we'll take a, about a 15 minute break and uh, give people a chance to uh, get coffee or water or whatever they need, and then we will resume. Are we paused? Good to see you. Good to see you.
Okay, so when you're presenting, they're not on the Can I hit the slide to go? Okay. Are we back on? Okay. Okay. Be a second. Yeah. <laughs> nice picture, Jim Lake. Yeah, I think there's Timothy Lake. Oh, pretty sure it's Timothy Lake. Are we back on? Oh, okay. So welcome back to the Oregon State Marine Board meeting for uh, July 28th. We are in Curry County at the Curry County Public Library, a beautiful facility, and we are on item D, which is the boating safety data. So welcome. Brian Paulson. Thank you, Chair Early, members of the board. For the record, I'm Brian Paulson, Voting Safety Program Manager for the Oregon State Marine Board. Today, I'm going to share with you um, a fairly complex overview of data uh, and statistics, more, um, more so looking at our law enforcement contracts and, and law enforcement contacts and those type of things. So to start the, the presentation out, one of the things I want to go over is really four underlying themes that I hear consistently uh, within our, our programs. So that's 32 county sheriff offices that we contract with, uh, as well as the state police, um, staffing shortages. So there are programs that are unable to hire people. They, they either have turnover, um, they're not able to get a Marine deputy for the, the summer, um, they may get a Marine deputy for the last half of the, the season, um, there's definitely been some hiring challenges. The other part is enforcement priorities. So we may have a program that has one or two Marine deputies on staff and then due to other staffing shortages, they get put on road patrol, um, whether it be a week at a time, a couple days at a time. Uh, it's definitely something that we, we noticed the last couple of years. The other piece is non-motorized compliance. As we've seen the last few years, um, the increase in non-motorized use, specifically kayaks and stand-up paddleboards, We've also seen an increase um, in, in different uh, categories, instance fatalities, and so we'll look at that. And then sustainable funding. When I talk about sustainable funding, uh, over the last 10 years, the law enforcement allocation has gone up about 11%. Um, however, in general, most programs, the cost to run that program has gone up significantly, you know, 30, 40, 50%. So there's programs out there that historically had two Marine deputies on staff, and now they're they're in this point where they've got below two. They only have one full-time Marine deputy because that funding gap between two and one, there's not enough money there to hire that second person, if that makes sense. So those are the four underlying themes, just to keep in mind when we're looking through things here. I'll definitely point them out as we go through the data. Um, first thing we're gonna look at is a kind of a contracts analysis. So we're gonna look at program costs. So the actual allocated law enforcement budget, um, and then what's actually uh, reimbursed out there. So the total expense budget. We're gonna look at patrol hours. Now, when we do contracts every year, we get an action plan from the sheriff office, and it's gonna show us you know, the waterways that patrol, um, their anticipated activities. It's gonna show how many actual patrol hours, and it's gonna show program hours. And so we're gonna look at those, what they state in the action plan for the contract, but then also what's the actuals. We're gonna look at shore patrol versus water patrol and some trends there. Then also in program hours, one area that we get a lot of um, reported hours is admin and then road patrol, which is when a Marine deputy is going off, um, you know, those duties onto the road patrol duties and then also trailer time. So the budget allocation for fiscal year 21-22, uh, right at 6.7 million. Now, uh, about two years ago, uh, Randy Henry, he put together a great presentation that went over the allocation formula. I'm not gonna go in depth to that, but it was created in 2010. It looks at three main components. Uh, one is the waterway use days. So looked at triannual survey data, AIS permits at the time, there wasn't waterway access at that time. Um, Non-resident boat examination reports also, also looks at um, economic index. So there's a significant difference in top step salaries from Marine deputies, you know, across the state. So it looked at that census data, then it also looked at the complexity of the waterways. And so that is put into a formula and then it takes that bucket of money and basically distributes it based on those factors for the 32 um, counties. 
So we're going to look at uh, the last three years in regards to FY 1819, 1920, and 2021 on the actual program costs. So this looks at, um, for, for shorting, I'll just say FY 19, this looks at the budget. So it's 5.5 million. And on this specific year, in the graph, you can show the actual allocated program cost. So that's how much money we had in the contract for that specific program. And it looks, and then it looks at what the actual cost was, what they actually got reimbursed from, or reimbursed for from the Marine Board. So FY19, 94% of the budget was expensed, and then 302,000 in reversion. So 44% of the programs expensed their total budget. 38% um, of the programs had greater than 10%, and 25 had greater than 20% of their budget was unspent. So theoretically, they spent 80% of their budget or more. Or excuse me, so yeah, 80%. Uh, and then 6% of the programs had greater than 70% unspent. And when we start looking at FY20, um, the budget dropped a little bit in the total allocation. Our reversion was 276,000, right at 95% expense. When we look at the trends, we had 41% of the programs expense their total budget. 34% of the programs had greater than 10% unspent. 28% um, of the programs that had greater than 20% unspent. And then 80% of the programs from the FY19 that had the highest percentage that was reverted back, so basically unspent funds, those were the same um, from fiscal year to fiscal year. So it definitely was trending. And then looking at FY21, budget was 5.4 million, reversion was 420,000. So you look, we, we continue to increase our reversion amount that's getting um, not spent. So on this specific fiscal year, we had 34% of the programs expense their total budget, 44% of the programs had greater than 10% that they didn't spend, 38% of the programs had greater than 20% that they didn't spend, and then 9% of the programs had greater than 50% of their budget that they, they didn't use. Hey, Brian. Yes, sir. While you're on the grass, I see there's no definite spending in any of these. They're spending all the funds they have. But you're saying they're short of funds, they don't have enough money. So I'm trying to reconcile that with what you're showing on the graph. Uh, undoubtedly, they have costs that probably exceed what they've been allocated. And they're just covering them through different means. This graph just shows that they're spending all the allocation they're given. So, so remember, I would interpret this graph to mean they got enough money and they're spending it all. Member Withy, I think uh, what you're asking has to do with a couple of things that aren't explained here very well. One, there's programs that the Marine Board is the total contribution to their Marine program, and there's programs that were a really small amount. Um, there's some Metro programs that they might expense their total Marine, month, Marine Board funds in the first quarter, but they're going to carry that Marine program through the rest of the fiscal year with their own funds. We have Marine programs that use um, all of our funds for personnel expense, and they cover all the operations. So, though this tells a little bit of the picture, it really is a case by case basis, I think. So, in effect, they may need more money, but they're just covering for marine expenses, but they're covering it through other funds that they have available. Or, or, or in some certain, you know, circumstances, they're not having any marine patrol out there because they don't have the funds for it. Okay. So they, they may have a uh, an agency that can't cover the difference. So that, that definitely is a circumstance. So program cost trends, we've, we've seen reversion percentage. It continues to increase. Um, a lot of that, you know, can stem back to staffing shortages, enforcement priorities. Um, we're seeing a greater number of programs that are spending less of their budget. However, the overall cost has been increasing. That's where we get in that, that sustainable funding and that funding gap. Um, we have specific programs consistently have a large percent of unspent budget, and those are programs that is that is a staffing shortage. They don't spend their budget because they don't have the staff. And then we have smaller programs that generally have the highest percent of budget because their their marine program is so small that that they just it's not on their radar. Um, so looking at actual patrol hours. So going back to 
what I call contract or their, their action plan. In FY19, there is 62,848 patrol hours that were contracted, so that's in the contract, but the actuals was 40,998. Now in parentheses, in the percentage and the actual, there are programs that go over the patrol hours, and generally those are programs that have you know, a large bucket of money that they put towards the Marine program. Um, so you, at the graph, you can see the proposed patrol hours that was in contract, and then you can see the actuals. So you can see there's there's definitely some trends if you look at, you know, in the next three years that we do, but there's some anomalies. There's programs that may, they, they have a really good Marine program, they might have a retirement, and then the next year they have a hard time recruiting a new Marine deputy. So there is definitely going to be outliers. There's, there's a story with every graph. Um, this specific FY19, 16 programs met or exceeded, or 16% of the programs met or exceeded the contract patrol hours. 25% of the programs reported between 81 and 95%. Um, but 38% of the programs reported less than 52% 52 of the contract patrol hours. So that's almost 40% of the programs didn't even do half the hours that they said they would. And that really much that really pretty much comes back down to the staffing and the, the, the enforcement changes. The enforcement priority is staffing. And that's because of staffing. Enforcement priorities change because of staffing shortages. Yeah. Yes. yeah, staffing shortages and enforcement priorities, they go hand in hand, but they are definitely two different things. Um, and but one influences the other. Absolutely. So how many uh, staffing shortages are related to the lack of funds? There are a few programs that have expressed consistently to me that they could hire another Marine deputy. Their program could flourish more if they had enough funding there to hire that additional Marine deputy, but they don't. They don't have it in their agency and they don't get that in allocation from us. So are we taking that in consideration with our Marine allocation? So the the allocation formula was designed to be fair across the board on the burden that boating and the different boating use across the state puts on those different agencies. Now that formula was in 2010 when it was created and it was updated in 2016 to, to reflect current data. However, um, there has not been any changes in the allocation formula since. And you're, you're going to get to it, but are there changes planned? I mean, are you going to reevaluate that allocation formula? In 2019, the Law Enforcement Advisory Group looked at the, the formula for a considerable amount of time and nothing was changed at that time because it, it's one of those that it's going to be very difficult. You're going to have programs that, that could flourish with more money. You're going to have programs that even if we give more money, they can't hire additional staff. Um, and there's programs that it would be very difficult um, to tell them that they would get reduced money because water we use has changed in their their you know area of control we have we had as you've seen you know use increase in certain areas use has decreased in other areas um, so it's it could be updated for sure there's there's no doubt about it um, the means of going about and being fair would be uh, something that we'd have to look into further so an FY20 patrol hours contract was 55,040 uh, actual was 38,829 so 71% of the patrol hours were fulfilled for the contract. That's 22% of the programs met or exceeded the contract patrol hours. 19% of the programs reported between 81 and 95%. So they're really right there. There could be something very uh, minute that caused them not to fulfill those. And then 25% of the programs reported less than 52% of the contract patrol hours. So we still have quite a few uh, programs that aren't even doing half the patrol hours that their that are action plan said. Looking back on FY21, contract was 55,926. The actuals was 36,020. So you can see we're you know, continuing to decrease the amount of patrol hours. 25% um, of the programs met or exceeded. 13% of the programs reported between 81 and 95. 31% of the programs reported less than 52% of the contract patrol hours. And it is worth noting on this specific uh, fiscal year that 2% of the actual patrol hours were wildfire response. Um, that was across seven programs. So that, was, that does uh, capture the September 2020 wildfires. So patrol hour trends on water patrol, um, 
generally continues to decrease when we look at across all programs. Um, the budget expenditure has no direct correlation to patrol hours. So the amount of money that they're expensing in their budget does not correlate to if they have more patrol hours. Um, there are a few specific programs that consistently meet or exceed. Generally, those are the ones that contribute their own, their own bucket of money for the program. And then smaller programs generally have the highest margin of inconsistency. So that goes back to staffing shortages, enforcement priorities. There's, it's really hard when you have a smaller program to consistently build that program, um, have trained staffing, those type of things. So looking at program hours, and, and that is going to encapsulate like training, admin, uh, ADV, investigation, uh, road patrol. That's where program hours are going to be captured in our reporting. So in FY19, contract was 61,731. The actuals was 46. 2012, 50% of the programs met or exceeded their contract program hours. So you can see a lot more programs are actually meeting or exceeding the program hours versus patrol hours. 22% of the programs reported greater than 150% of their contract program hours. Um, some of that uh, definitely, as we talk about, you know, enforcement priorities, they, they may be put on the road for a couple of weeks and that's when you can start racking up those program hours when they're doing road patrol. So there was uh, 5,765 hours that were over contract reported for FY19 and a lot of those did attribute to admin, non-Marine um, Board related trainings. Tell me about uh, road patrol or funding road patrol and what does that include? So Marine deputies, oftentimes will have to be put on the road to cover other uh, enforcement. So it's not Marine. It's non, yeah, it's the road patrol is going to be when they are off Marine duties, but they are reporting it as hours to the Marine board. So they're not driving along the river. They are no longer driving along the river. That would be shore patrol. So this would be specifically they're doing, whether it's traffic, they're investigating, they're doing a, you know, and, and the one piece is, and we'll look at it further in this presentation is looking at like how many 10 hour shifts or actual road patrol that are that are reported um, on this FY19, 13% of the programs reported less than 52% of the contracted program hours. Uh, looking at program hours again, FY20, 58,186 were contract. The actual was 42,229. This um, this specific year encapsulates uh, a few different things, but looking at it, 31% of the programs met or exceeded their contract pr program hours. 19% uh, of the programs reported greater than 150%, and we're at 6,075 hours over contract. And But still, 19% of the programs reported less than 52% of that contract of program hours. And generally, those are smaller programs. Those are the ones that their, their staffing uh, fluctuates significantly more. Looking at FY21, and, I, and we're almost out of this long haul look at these type of things. Uh, 53,914 contract hours, the actual was 40,859. Uh, that's 76% of the program hours were met. So you can see program hours continue to increase uh, a little bit from the previous year. So that's 32% of the programs met or exceeded the contract program hours. 13% of the programs reported greater than 150%. And we had 5,089 hours that were over those contract hours, um, with 19% of the programs reported less than 52%. So program hour trends, program hours are variable. They're often related to the sheriff office priorities, you know, going back to enforcement. Um, budget expenditure, so how much the budget is used have no direct correlation to how many program hours. Um, and the program allocation and budget has no direct correlation two program hours. So if we give um, a specific program, you know, X amount of dollars and it's half what another program gets, it's not going to be half the program hours. It's it's definitely variable. Um, and then also one thing that's worth noting is specific programs consistently exceed contracted program hours. So hours that are out there not directly making contacts to voters um, greater than 200% but they also have less than 50% of their contract patrol hours. So they're 200% of their program hours, but less than 50% of their patrol hours. So looking at patrol versus program hours, uh, this is fiscal year 21-22. So this is 
the year that just ended in uh, June 30th of, of 2022. 46% uh, 40, of the hours across the board were for patrol, 54% of the hours were for program. Um, and at the graph, you can see the patrol hours versus program hours county by county. Um, you can see that 6% of the programs met or exceeded uh, the patrol hours. Um, when I say exceeded, there's 324 uh, hours over, um, you know, across the 32 counties total. So 44% of the contract patrol hours are not completed. So that's 25,711 patrol hours that were in contract that did not get completed in FY22. 31% of the programs met or exceeded the contracted program hours, and 31% of the program hours that were contracted were not completed. So you can see there's less program hours that were not completed percent-wise than there was patrol hours. It doesn't equate to money not spent. Green money, our allocation not being spent when they don't have. Member with your correct. So if you look at the percentage of patrol hours and program hours, and you look at the the budget that was spent, it does not okay. match up number wise. You're correct, percentage or number wise. So looking at shore versus water patrol, as as mentioned earlier, shore patrol can be making contacts along the riverbank. It could be making contacts in the boat ramp facilities. It could be uh, anything that's on the shoreline of a lake you know, making boater contacts. Um, water patrol is actually on water patrol, whether it's motorized or non-motorized patrol vessel. So 31% of the programs, um, water patrol is less than 25% of their total patrol hours. Um, and, and going back to the graph, you can see that it shows the shore patrol in blue and the water patrol in orange uh, to give you a comparison county to county. 56% of the programs, water patrol, is less than 50% of their total patrol hours. And then 28% of the program shore patrol is greater than 80% of their total patrol hours. So there's some different things to look at and conceptualize there. So in program hours, there's three areas that, that definitely accumulate and they are, as you can see, extremely variable. One of them uh, to point out is admin. We have some programs that the admin burden for their marine program is significantly more than others. 22% um, across the board is the average admin specific hours reported. Um, I will say that we do have some programs that do a base rate admin charge um, on some of the contracts and, and that is not reflected in that specific admin hours. 16% of the programs had admin specific hours that were over 40%, and then 9% of the programs had admin specific hours that were over 50% of their program hours. And then looking at uh, road patrol, 22% of the programs reported road patrol assist hours is greater than 20% of their, their actual patrol hours. So that's 20% of their time for patrol um, was spent on, on road, not marine related duties. And then 47% of the programs trailer time is greater than 25%. So we had programs that they have to trailer over hundred miles each way to patrol certain water bodies. So that can add up a ton of program hours. And oftentimes, you know, say if they have a waterway that is, um, having a lot of non-compliance issues, they might be going that waterway every day versus another one. So that's where one year they're going to have a lot more program hours or trailer hours, uh, correlating to that. So looking at road patrol assist, um, I put together this, this data you can see here that shows FY19, FY20, FY21, and FY22. It looks at every single county. It looks at the amount of road patrol hours that they uh, reported the Marine Board in their contract hours. It also looks at the number of 10 hour greater shifts that were reported. Um, so you can see uh, there is some correlation, you know, in May 20 through October 20, the civil unrest in certain areas of the state um, that correlates to the large spike uh, in Marine Patrol that were, that were basically doing road patrol duties. Um, road patrol assist is captured, uh, as I said, in the, the program hours, um, but this also doesn't take into account Marine deputies that are taken off of uh, Marine Patrol for the entire summer. Uh, we do have programs that that'll call me 
and they their enforcement priorities change and they have to pull a, a marine deputy off for the entire season those hours aren't captured in here because then they're not in marine so let's let's look at performance measures now that we we've kind of covered the contract piece so we're going to look at boater contacts um, we're going to look at the cost per contact and patrol we're going to look at uh, our electronic boat examination report system that we put out uh, in may we're going to look at kind of the geospatial analysis that you can use with that. We're going to look at uh, warnings, citations, and voting under the influence, and those trends. And then we're also going to just touch on education and outreach. So, boater contacts for 2021. Uh, our marine law enforcement partners made 29,507 contacts. And if you look at the 2020 and 2019 numbers that are to the, the right of that, it's very close to the same amount of boater contacts. Even though we saw those large fluctuations in program hours and patrol hours, we're right there, uh, about 30,000 boater contacts. And those are boat examination reports. That doesn't uh, encapsulate all the intervention, the conversations that Marine Law Enforcement has with people that aren't actually reported boater contacts. So these, these are ones that they actually fill out a boat examination report. If you want to look at the just below that, it shows how many hint inspections, it shows how many motorized uh, boat examination reports that were passing, uh, how many were failed and they gave a warning, and then also shows the citations. Uh, it is worth noting that 62% of the contacts uh, in 2021 were non-motorized. And if you look at the graph, it's going to show the, the amount of contacts uh, per county and the percent overall for total for the state. It's worth noting, uh, like Clackamas County, 20% of the state's contacts are made in Clackamas County. So what were the uh, reasons for the contacts on non-motorized? Just give me typical. Yeah, examples. typically non-motorized is going to be a life jacket, not visible. Okay. Um, and, and in regards to uh, waterway access, that's, you know, that's another piece of that. Um, but usually it's a life jacket, not present. Are there any demographic information uh, per county? We uh, do not capture any demographics whatsoever. So cost per contact. So if you look at the contacts and you break it down per county, I can actually calculate uh, how much a voter contact in that county costs us. So I did have to remove an outlier. We had a specific county that was reimbursed for $45,000 and made absolutely no contacts. Um, the, the lowest cost per contact was 32 and the highest was 1166. Um, the average uh, contact is every 57 minutes by Marine Patrol statewide. I will tell you that that is very seasonal. We have programs that our cost per contact will be close to $5,000 in the wintertime and then that exact same county, the summertime will be less than $50. So it's very seasonal based on waterway use. Um, there's an average of one operational violation for every 20 hours of patrol. There's an average of one registration violation uh, every 53 hours of patrol. And the one thing that was interesting when I was going through all this data and, and, and calculating everything, the cost for contact and how you get to that 178 number is significantly different than than my average hour patrol cost, and they're within a dollar piece. So that tells me this, the data and, and the roundabout way of getting that number is pretty close. Um, and then I don't believe we have uh, presented this to the board yet, but we roll out our EBER, what we call our EBER electronic boat examination report in May. It is uh, basically Prior to this, we had a piece of paper um, very similar to a site book, and that's how we made boat examination reports and they would get entered in the database. The one thing that we've been struggling to use with that is any kind of geospatial data. So leveraging technology in the Survey123 platform, which we've used on a lot of different things, our boat, uh, boating obstruction reporting tools on Survey123, we actually do pin inspections. We we're able to roll this out statewide and at preseason, um, and Academy this year, uh, we taught students and, and Marine Patrol how to use this program. So this is looking at a dashboard, very basic. Our law enforcement partners can look at this. So it's showing um, blue is passing, red is failing. Um, I pulled this up and this was looking at data inputted from April 1st through uh, July 21st. So you can see areas of the state that Marine Patrol is making lots of contacts. 
you can see areas of state that have waterways that are definitely getting used and nobody's making any contacts. If we zoom in a little bit further, you can start to see there's some trends. You know, you're going to see areas of red that there's a lot of non-compliance. Um, and then you can see areas of blue that have really good compliance. And that's going to be carriage requirements, you know, live jackets, whistles, fire extinguishers. It, um, we can break it down non-motorized versus motorized. Uh, there's a lot of value, though, in seeing the different color trends. Um, areas that we get a lot of inquiries about. We can sit there and look exactly where Marine Patrol, we can put it in by agency, we can put it in by time, water body, officer, I can look and see where these voter contacts are being made. We can even look in areas of the state that you can see is almost all red. This is this is an area that there is a lot of non-compliance and specifically this area, there's a lot of non-motorized compliance and mostly stand-up paddleboards and kayaks. And then if we want to look at a specific waterway, we can zoom in there and we can see which area the, the lake is getting used the most. We can see which area um, sometimes where the boat ramps are, you can see there's a lot of contacts there and then they go out throughout the lake and their day of patrol and they make a lot of contacts because that's the popular areas of the waterway. Can I ask a question on the map? How does the map recognize where the contact is being made? Um, is it is it through the device to the great, officer? Great question. So the Survey123 app, the beauty of it is, is it can be used offline. So if I'm a Marine deputy on my smartphone or tablet, I'm making a boater contact. I can be driving the boat. I can be out on PwC. I can make that boater contact. And if I don't have um, cell service or Wi-Fi, as soon as I get back, it sends all that data in. But when it takes that survey, it gets a, a lat longitude. And that's where we get the color coordination um, versus the pass and, and fail also. So we can take that data and so this is a new thing for us. We, in, in all fairness, we did test it the last few years. We had some counties that were piloting this for us. Um, we were comfortable rolling it out statewide and it's been very helpful. Uh, we are in the middle of putting together dashboards so I can pull a lot more data um, and different analytics that we can look at where we couldn't before. I assume you could also filter for, like, say, the red dots to know which ones are motorized and unmotorized. Yeah, right? yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we can color code things. We can. Um, there's, there's. When you have geospatial data, there's a lot of different tools that you can use with it. So, and has law enforcement embraced this program? Is it easier, or um, do, do you have some reluctance to get away from the paper? So, I think initially like anything new um, especially technology it can be hard to embrace but after everybody's gone through it we we sat there in preseason made everybody pull it up on their phone do boater contacts there at academy it was amazing because i could look up at lake billy chinook and see all the students doing the boater contacts as it pulls it up um it is it has now been you know a routine thing I and mean, we've made improvements it's one of those things that we're going to have a, a group sit down you know my super users i call them at the end of the summer and then those that are maybe not uncomfortable and make adjustments to it so it's it's something that um we will continue to use because it gets rid of the paper we spend a lot of money on citation books paper different things and it, it is a cost savings but also as a marine deputy they can have the tablet there instead of writing down now i can operate a boat and i can just hit it's we we made the app so that it was push button. There's no drop down menus and it automatically populates so I can get the waterway uh, cascading basically where it's at. So it's faster. They can make a contact and get that information. They don't have to write anything anymore. Um, it seems to be a time savings. And and the, the geospatial piece, I think, is my favorite thing so far. I assume you, you would also leverage a lot of this data to <clears throat> drive like outreach efforts, like for instance in Ben. Absolutely. There's a lot of red yeah. dots. Happening. Yeah, that this is this is concerning on many levels, but not surprising. I don't think I represent any of those red dots. <laughs> <laughs> not surprising at all. So going into warnings and citations for 2021, uh, the graph shows the sites versus warning. So that's the percent uh, county by county, uh, statewide. Boating related citations, 1,256. There was 7,359 warnings. Uh, there were 11 programs that cited zero boaters. There were three programs that gave no warnings to boaters. 
And then we had two programs that had zero warnings and zero citations. 4.2% uh, of the voter contacts ended in a citation and 25% of voter contacts ended in warning. Uh, so that's 29% non-compliance rate for contacts. So about a, uh, you know, every four voters are going to end in a warning. And generally when we're making a, a voter contact, it's usually because something visually was wrong. This, uh, this dives into citations and warning a little bit deeper. Uh, the, the graph on the left, and then I did include the hard data just because it's worth recognizing that some of them, there's not a whole lot of operational violations, but these are really the, what I would consider the more risky, um, dangerous violations that we see out there. You can see, uh, for example, for BUII and reckless operation, there's zero warnings. Those automatically go to citation. Um, 17% of the warnings in 2021 were for a life jacket carriage um, and 35% of the citations that were given in 2021 for, for life jackets. 20% uh, of all citations and all warnings are for life jacket related. So the 35% up top was specifically for carriage requirements. There's additional, um, you know, uh, citations and warnings for, for the child, which you can see the child PFD statewide. There's 32 warnings and 55 citations given for that. 17% all warnings are for waterway access permit and 20% of all citations across the state are for lack of having a waterway access permit. 33% uh, of all warnings are registration violations and 31% of all citations are related to some type of registration violation. So how much of the um, citation um, versus the, the warnings uh, is driven by you know, what the board kind of directed LE to be, you know, to do more educational outreach and, and you know, be ambassadors on the water versus being seen as? Chair sure, Early, I think the more we talk about certain things and enforcement and, and, and how we want to, uh, convey those different messages to voters when we're making contacts. I think you'll notice when we start looking at BUII, you know, for example, five, 10 years ago, BUII was a huge discussion point. Mm -hmm. And as you will notice in the, the citations and when we get to the, the share in another slide, it's continued to decrease because we haven't talked about it as much. When we talk about registration clients and, and there's been some registration clients projects the last few years, we see an increase in registration uh, warnings and citation because that's a focus of our law enforcement partners. Um, waterway access is fairly new, so I think it's hard to kind of put a grip on that one, but there is a you know a fair amount of uh, warning citations that are waterway access past not being present. Um, but the registration violation, that's something we've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, we have that operation ship shape that we, we have done the last few years. I think 2018 is the first year we did it. Um, that that's a registration, you know, uh, piece that we just keep talking about. So I think um, if there is any guidance from the board on wanting specific things to to be prioritized out in the field, that we can definitely send that messaging. Thank you. Yeah. Question: um, Because the waterway access permit is not something that's super visible um, under the current implementation of it, are those like a secondary? Are most of those contacts being like? They don't see a PFD, so they come over and they talk to somebody about the PFD. And oh, by the way, do you have your water access permit? It's like, oops, I don't have either. So, so are those looking like a kind of like a secondary violation? So in regards to the violation, most most contacts with non-motorized is going to be the life jacket. And then it goes into talking about the the other the carriage requirements and the whistle. Usually when law enforcement's asking somebody about their waterway access, they just ask them verbally, do you have your waterway access? If somebody knows about it and says they have it, and they assume yeah. they have it. If they don't have it and they don't know what it is, then yeah, that's yeah, when yeah. they have the further conversation. But I guess my question is, are they actively targeting people and going over and saying, do you have no. a water access permit? Or is it more like, do you know you're supposed to have a life jacket? And oh, by the way, do you have a water access? The general consensus I get from the field is that it's a secondary conversation after they didn't have a life jacket. And the one piece about it being visible, um, I hear that often, so. So going into boating under the influence, uh, as I said earlier, you look at boating citation or boating under the influence citations. 
over the last, you know, I looked at 2015 to 2022, they've decreased. Um, we look at programs that make uh, building on the influence citations and it has continued to decrease. But we also look at the impairment. So we look at the fatalities that were caused by impairment. It is dramatically decreased as well. So that is all, um, I think, due to a lot of good efforts, you know, the last five to 10 years on, on uh, those special emphasis, you know, we, we do a lot of great work around the 4th of July and, and those type of things. In regards to this year, 70% uh, of the citations for voting under the influence were for non-motorized. 92% uh, of those are in one county and 77% of those are on one water body. If you look historically, that water body has a lot of um, voting under the influence uh, challenges. So. Looking at incidents and fatalities, uh, fatalities have uh, continued to rise. In regards to 2020, that was a record year for us, and it, it decreased in 2021. And then this year, we are sitting at eight voting fatalities. Uh, five of those are non-motorized. Uh, and six out of eight of those were no life jacket. If you look at incidents, we average about uh, 65 incidents a year. Um, this year, we're right about 35. Um, looking at fatalities where there was no life jacket being worn, we're hovering around that, that national average um, between 70 and 80 percent. So very consistent that you know, 70, 80 percent of our fatalities every year, if they were wearing a job, life jacket, they'd likely survive. Um, and then looking at fatality percentage non-motorized, um, I didn't pull data back, uh, you know, further than 2014, but it, it's been consistently 50 percent or greater of our, our voting fatalities. Looking at education outreach, uh, we have a great Waterwitz school program. It's a curriculum that introduces science, stewardship and safety. Uh, we have lesson plans for K through 12. We have our junior boating program, which uh, introduces boating, water safety. It's more of a hands-on uh, curriculum where the Waterwitz is in the classroom. Um, we also have our boating safety advocates, which serve in schools, at events, on waterways to educate boaters about um, water and boating safety. And then also, um, I put together here some data that shows all our different programs in the different fiscal years and the, the amount of work that they've done and outreach uh, influencing kids. So in 2021, we had direct contact with 26,000 kids. Um, and that's in-person education outreach. And that was uh, with our Marine law enforcement partners and our boating uh, safety advocates we were able to reach those, those kids, which is a huge number. Um, and then just circling back, um, when you're digesting this, I know this was a lot of data, a lot of statistics. You'll have a copy of the presentation, but really, if you start fine tuning a lot of um, the, the inconsistencies and, and, and patrol hours, you know, staffing shortages, enforcement priorities, um, the funding, and then and then looking at the non-motorized as areas start to increase, you know, how maybe think about how we can uh, address that. Really appreciate the presentation. I'm suffering a little data overload right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're a numbers nerd, aren't you? Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm trying to figure out figure out how we can help uh, the problem areas. You're saying you need more funds. Uh, how does the board help you with the funding? Member with the, I think uh, funds will always be a challenge. I think uh, direction, you know, if we look at, at some of these programs, uh, they fall into these categories and there's some programs that there's inconsistencies that maybe we start thinking about, you know, do we have performance standards that we maybe, you know, put in contract that are, that are held accountable? I guess that's probably the, the best context I can use right now. Uh, in regards to funding, that, that's something that is, you know, I can't put a number on it, um, but I could definitely do more research. Uh, one of the areas I'd like an update on is the intern program. I think it's been pretty successful in some counties. Now, maybe the intern's the wrong term, but you bring these folks in and they work with the sheriff's department or apprentices or what have you. 
it seemed to be pretty successful in some kind. So, remember with you, what I think you're referring to is our Marine Service Officers, which, which is generally going to be a non-sworn officer. Um, sometimes they're in the cadet program and, and they, they work on the boats all summer long, uh, getting that exposure. It, there are a lot of a lot of programs that do use that resource and that position, um, and we uh, definitely are an advocate of that. But isn't one of the objectives of the program to eventually bring them on uh, as a Marine Sheriff? That would be a question better answered by an agency in regards to they, they're going to go from a Marine Service Officer to a sworn officer. Um, is is definitely a lot lot more yeah. logistics than just hiring them on as a Marine deputy. And I went out with Clackamas County Sheriff and they had one there, and that was their objective. He'd been there for several years, so that seemed like a very good way to recruit in Marine sheriffs, and while getting uh, some value out of their labor hours, because he was using them quite extensively. Okay. That would be program specific, though. Those would be program decisions versus other decisions. Yeah, it's very so that would be putting inserting ourselves on how they hire people and they recruit people yeah, and how they better. and that's not part of it. Now, when they submit an action plan and it is very program specific, I can think of about four or five that have Marine service officers off the top of my head. They have that in their budget for that position because it is significantly less of a, a payroll burden, um, but just as beneficial as a Marine deputy out there on the water. Thank you for the presentation. Sure, really, if I might just add one, one piece on the question, the um, around the budget pieces, I think Brian was alluding to the fact that all of our programs, there's limitless requests for the money. So really what we wanted to do with this was start a, a discussion with the board that we hope continues around making sure we're getting the best investment and the return on investment for our, our law enforcement dollars. And as Chair Early mentioned, it's, you know, are we conveying to the law enforcement programs what enforcement strategies we think work well? And so this should hopefully be the start of that discussion. And, and as you consume that data, I'm sure there'll be more questions and things that will come up, but we want to make this a little more regular discussion because it is one of the biggest pieces of our budget. 42 percent. Yeah, we haven't always brought this kind of information to the board, right. so. And it's not only part of our budget, but it's very much part of our success. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and it's part of our mission and our in our vision, too, because, you know, it's it, it, we're here to protect Oregon voters as well as support Oregon voters. And we ask a lot of our law enforcement partners. And so how can we support them and how can we provide what they need to to be able to accomplish what we can continue to ask them to do? So. And I don't know if I missed this um, when I was out, but um, <clears throat> is there the opportunity to maybe uh, for the Marine Board to create a program to help recruit, uh, you know, and and uh, and maybe in those efforts um, we can look at how do we recruit, you know, diversity within uh, law enforcement too, and then it could almost become a resource for some of the law enforcement agencies when they do need to recruit. Maybe we have a database of people that have gone through some sort of filter and maybe even basic training. Uh, that then we can direct them over to whatever county uh, needs to employ. Member Huseman, thank you. I will definitely look at that. It was a great presentation. Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah. I like numbers too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the tool is amazing. Yeah, yeah the, the Eber, I, I imagine at a later yeah. date, I'll share more. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, that was item D, and so uh, we are going to move on to our item E, which is the 2023-2025. Um, Member Moran, did you have any questions or anything? I couldn't see you because the PowerPoint was up there. No questions, just trying to take in all the info. Okay. I'll try to check with you first when we go to something and we go to discussion just so, or something just to make sure that you don't get left on line. Thanks. I'll make sure to unmute myself too if I have questions. Okay, thank you. 
So item E is our 23-25 budget and Christy Cornish, thank you for yes. being here. All right, I'm going to give you some more numbers. So morning, uh, Chair Early and members of the board. I am Christy Cornish for the record. I am the business services manager. I am going to go over the 23-25 agency requested budget and seek approval at the end of this. So first thing I want to highlight is we didn't have any major changes. This is something that I discussed in the April is there was no major program changes that we were in. Uh, encountering or looking at for the future. So it, I, I don't mean to stop you right yeah. in your presentation, but just for a refresher, because not not everybody's been here, mm -hmm. but this is what we present to the governor for our Correct. agency. Correct. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. So that yes, this, yeah. so this is the agency recommended budget. So this is what goes to um, DAS and the governor and they review it and then come back with what's called uh, the governor's uh, budget. And then we go from there to the legislature. Thank you. So uh, just to let you kind of know some major highlights uh, for the narrative portion is we just had a small revenue increase, very small. Um, so, and I'll go through all of that as well. That, oh, thanks Larry. Um, so it looks like we're up about 113,000. Um, so like I said, that's very small compared to the entire budget. Um, one thing we did have an increase on was our fuel tax calculations. Just to let you know, which is you, you're probably wondering where that comes from, is Oregon State does a study every four years. They send it out to a random sampling of uh, voters and they provide numbers for how much fuel consumption they've used. And so there was actually an increase in the fuel consumption that you'll take, as, and I'll show you that as well. Um, and we're thinking that's probably because of COVID. A lot of people were staying at home, going boating with families, and that was an increase. So actually, timing wise, we're really lucky. Um, quite frankly, if we had it this year, it might be not so great because of the fuel high cost. And so uh, it, it, timing wise, it worked out great. Um, also, you'll see in here is the ARPA. Uh, money was shown as a revenue in 21-23, but it won't be in the 23-25. It's a period. And what that is, is that's the million dollars that we received for removing derelict vessels. Um, and then also at the end, I'll show you, we are submitting for three policy option packages. You may hear the term POPs. That's what that is, is the policy option packages. And I'll provide a description of those at the end of this. And once again, a POP is when we are asking for money yep. from the legislature. Yes, correct. Um, so anything you're going to do that's different or new, um, you have to present it and basically ask permission to, to use that those funds. Larry's on it. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> so what we're looking at right now is what's for revenue other funds. Um, and I tried to put up uh, the 23, uh, excuse me, 21-23 versus the 23-25. So you can see um, slight increases uh, for registration. Uh, fuel tax, you'll see that's significant. Uh, we went from 85.80 to 11 million. That's huge. Now realize that's not guaranteed 11 million because each year what we do is we'll take a look at the registration numbers for boats and then use the fuel tax consumption uh, survey that was in Oregon State's study. So 11 million is what we were estimating, that's forecasting, but that's not necessarily we're going to get 11 million dollars, so just know that. Um, and then also titling, um, that was just a slight decrease. Um, AIS, small decrease, uh, waterway access is increasing. Uh, you'll see um, obviously a lot more people are starting to move to kayaking um, and enjoying that sport. Uh, ARPA, you'll see obviously 21, 23 million dollars was in there. However, it's not for as revenue in the 23, 25. However, that money does carry over into the next biennium. Um, guides and uh, outfitters, you'll see slight increase, um, penalty interest, miscellaneous increase, mandatory education. So as you see, we went from 31,273,000 to 32,412,000. So that's that slight increase that you'll see for revenue for other funds. The increase in mandatory education, um, is that due to, um, to, to new programs? 
That, I believe, is for the um, folks that are getting the voter education cards for operating. Them okay, so are, is that based on uh, age demographics or something that are that you think are going to be also getting those now or because it's it's a lifetime card? Uh, sure, it really, uh, looks like Brian has some information he can share on this. So. Go ahead. Uh, Chair Early, I believe that's for the water sports endorsement program. That's what I was going to yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Which Thank is you. part of the mandatory education. Yes. Clarify. Yeah. So actually, I think I have another question. So you're showing um, a decrease in the AIS that's pretty substantial, and you're showing a pretty substantial increase in the waterway access. Is that because the, the AIS fee for non motorized has been rolled into it, so it's coming in through that pathway? So it gets transferred back? To my knowledge, and, and I'm probably going to look at Director Warren, is I believe originally it wasn't, it was all one program, and now we're starting to separate that out, that you actually have AIS and waterway access, and so it's separated. But it's collected the same, so it's coming in, it's through, collected it's coming the same. in through waterway access, and then it gets And then you sort off the $5, okay. yes. And that was through the, that was through the bill. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then this slide um, is showing us expenditures. And so you have the budget for the 21-23, which we're currently in right now, and then what we are forecasting for the budgeted 23-25. Um, you obviously see a slight increase in that, uh, the 2.86%. Um, so we were at 38 um, million 61 for the 21 23 however we will be at the 39 million 273 mark and that's what we're forecasting again these are not hard numbers because obviously many things can happen and uh, you know if you suddenly have a pandemic things can change considerably so but you'll still see a slight increase on that so on the abandoned boats we are still only as an agency allocating 150,000 but we have the million dollars in there so on expenditures it's going to be a carryover I would assume that we're going to start seeing some expenditures or are we going to start to work with DSL other partner agencies on that? So that's a good question. Fair request. Yeah, what that is is that's actually our ADV account, and by statute we can only put 150,000 or 150,000 dollars in there versus the ARPA money is a separate account. Um, that's coming out of um, the. It's a federal program. Yeah. And as you said, Chair, really, there is going to be some carryover that I, I believe gets explained in one of the future slides. OK, thank so you. That be a carryover in that yeah. piece. Yep. And then here, um, I was trying to well, actually. Let's go back to federal funds. OK, here we go. So this is the money that's coming in from federal funds and grants. Um, you'll notice that there is a slight increase of about 314,000. Um, and this is something that, you know, we worked with uh, Janine as well as Preston um, gathering these figures uh, to incorporate in our forecasting. On this slide, um, we broke this down into program allocation, so you guys can see by expenditures what's going to what. So you have about 62% uh, that are going to go to special payments. That's your uh, law enforcement uh, contracts. Um, about 26% is going to personal services. That's your staff costs. That's everybody that's working on the programs. And then about 12% is going to go to service and supplies. That's your administrative uh, costs like paper pens, computers, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we did an allocation by program, and that breaks it down. So you have admin, uh, administrative and education costs is about 24% of those expenditures. That's your director's office, uh, boating safety, registrations, business services. And then about 42% is law enforcement, and then about 30% is going to be uh, facilities. That's the grants. And then for budget comparison, um, we had broke this down into the 23, 25, and then also versus the 21, 23. So you'll see each of them have a slight uh, increase. 
except for the AIS, and that's because of the, the breakdown from the waterway access. Um, so you'll just see everything is just slightly a little bit more, but really nothing, no major changes. And here's the policy option packages. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are the three uh, policy option packages. They're basically papers that we submit to the governor and ask for these additional you know, resources, or maybe it's just even um, what I call housekeeping, just making sure that everything is correct. Um, and, and I had mentioned these last uh, April in our board meeting. So like manager reclassifications, this is where HR went in and said, this is where these positions should be. And so uh, one is the policy and environmental uh, manager position and then uh, registration as well. And so that's just no funding requests because already those positions are at that. It's just a housekeeping, making sure we're getting everything uh, as it should be. Then on there, we are also asking for the American Rescue Plan. That's the ARPA. Um, we've received $1 million in uh, the funds this biennium. But anything, because obviously we're not going to be able to spend that million dollars in the next, you know, uh, 11 months. So what we have to do is we have to ask for it to be carried over into the next biennium. Again, it's we have to ask permission um, to utilize those funds and expend those funds. So we'll be asking for additional money that goes into the next biennium. And then the last one that we are submitting is for our boating safety advocates, and that's creating five boating safety advocates throughout the state. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to actually do it as a, as a seasonal position and it'll, it'll make it a little bit better to find the skill sets um, versus putting it out as a contract. Um, because if we try to put it out in uh, what's called Oregon buys, which is where all the contracts go and solicitations, we have a hard time. You're not necessarily gathering the folks that are best for those positions. So we want to make sure that we get the best folks. In addition to, if we put them as a seasonal, then we can rehire them each year, and it makes it a lot easier administrative-wise. And so we're going to be submitting that, um, and that'll have um, 170, uh, excuse me, 171,045 um, as unspent uh, boating safety budget, and then uh, the rest will come out of the ending balance. So will these individuals or positions be contractors or uh, employees? They'll be actual seasonal employees. Seasonal employees. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I just want to put a real quick plug in here. Brian did a lot of work on this voting safety advocate with different communities. And really what we heard is the way we thought we would do it wouldn't necessarily work very well. You know, having a whole bunch of state administration on ten to twenty thousand dollar grants or contracts where some poor nonprofits then got to do $25,000 of work to use the money, just wasn't helping anybody. Um, and so this model was one that really working with these different organizations, this emerged as a good choice, so long as we stay connected, because this is one of the areas that we're, we're also doing some of that um, equity, environment, the environmental equity work that we've done and being able to hire folks that um, can get out in different communities and serve communities more directly than, uh, you know, sometimes law enforcement can with all their competing uh, priorities. So this is, this is, there's a lot behind this one. A lot of work went into this one on the staff side, and it was a good example. Of we, we started down one path and just really found out that we could serve communities better doing it a different way. So you currently have two under contract right now. And so oh, will they have to go through the state process of applying for those boating safety uh, temporary positions as well? Seasonals? Seasonals. Surely they would likely. I'm getting a big yes from the human resource. <laughs> Darn it, we brought human resource. <laughs> uh, yes, we always follow hiring guidelines. That would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. OK. And then um, secondly, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the, the deferment of the ARPA funds and um, how best, and, and maybe you don't have a vision yet about how best we're going to, to start to use those funds and um, partner with some of the agencies that maybe are going to get bigger funds. Well, and I, that may be. I can, I can okay. take a shot at it and then if Josh needs to fill anything in, we can do that. So uh, the funds, the good news is, is we have actually started expending those funds. Mm -hmm. The first group of votes was removed um, earlier this month, this month's been a long month, so I think it was earlier this month, 
And uh, I think there's actually, I just signed a contract last night for the next round and we're planning another round in October, but we're still not gonna be able to spend the entire million. And so we'll, we'll ask to continue that forward into the next biennium so we can continue to do that work. It's been a really good effort as, as folks mentioned earlier, Dorothy Dill, our program person there just does an amazing job of working with everybody involved. And we've had some really good contractors work on this. The other piece I don't think has been talked about today, and we had some folks talk about, you know, where's the budget on this and the long-term problems. And that's been a, been a long-standing issue. We understand that Department of Lands is going to uh, ask for a $40 million package in the next biennium. And they are working very closely with Josh and Dorothy about what that looks like and um, what, you know, what kinds of things will be taking care of that. There's some commercial and some recreational and so I guess as long as it would be, it would be good to hear from the board whether they support staff working with DSL on that request, that ask, and looking for ways the Marine Board can be a part of that and perhaps help and come back to the board if we see a board financial need around that area. No, I, I would say that would be really important to, to continue to work with our, you know, our partners, our agency partners to accomplish the goals that, that, that we want, you know, and getting rid of, abandoned derelict vessels is pretty high on that list so and as, as we you know one of the just through conversations you know some of the training uh, it looks like there's a limited number of uh companies that are able to do that kind of work so maybe uh if there's also uh, uh, a possibility to add look at that contract or that scope of work like how do we bring more or support other entrepreneurs that may be looking into, you know, expanding this kind of business. So we're not running into problem where, um, you know, there's very limited, and then that initially should bring the cost down to choose or the contracts. Sure. So, mm -hmm. and Member Guzman, that that is one of the things that we're we're interested too, is we have those conversations with DSL. Is um, that to spend forty million dollars is probably harder than sometimes it might seem just around the contractors. But you're right, we're hoping maybe is that money, is it becomes more consistent and reliable and the state continues to fill in funding sources for this issue, there's op there's business opportunities as well. And, and again, I think if business people know about them and can be educated and, and know that the funding is going to be around for a while, so it's worth their investment in equipment and energy, there's a real opportunity for someone to be involved in some of that. So, okay. Partnering with somebody like DSL would also solve some of the issues that some of the contractors have. So it's possible that they might be able to solve those issues. And, and we'll have to watch as well. One of the things we find is sometimes when an agency starts spending a lot more money than we spend, we, our contractors all of a sudden don't get as interested in our contracts. So we'll we'll work with them on those type of things as well. So, okay. yeah. But there there is definitely you heard from folks during public testimony. There there is an issue in the Portland area. We also have issues in the coastal area with commercial vessels and old salmon fleet. And so different parts of our state definitely have issues with this and it's something we need to continue to work on. So it's good to hear that the board wants us to keep working on that. Okay. All right. So actually we will be submitting um, with your approval the budget tomorrow. Um, hopefully you guys have had a chance to take a look at the numbers and uh, do you guys have any questions? No, I would make a motion that we um, submit the agency proposed budget to the governor's office. <clears throat> and I can second that motion. Yes. Okay. Additional questions, discussion? Okay. Great presentation. Thank you. Very mm -hmm. good. Thank All you. those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So member early, or chair, early, I, I would uh, assume this next one's going to take about a half an hour or so if, as you're thinking about. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of, I was just looking at that. Yeah. I, was, I was just going to make that <laughs> inquiry as to, to, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. Yeah. If um, we'll see how Josh does. Okay. Okay, so we are on to item F, which is the agency rule and policy making process overview. Very informational PowerPoint. So, are you going to draft it? 
Josh Mulholland. Josh. Well, apparently I need to keep it under 45 minutes. So, uh, uh, well, no. Director, Director Warren said 30, so. You know. <laughs> a lot of this is just, uh, this is a very informational PowerPoint, like you said, and, and meant to, to kind of spur some discussion. So a lot of the how long we go is going to be on you, on you, the board. Can you make it screen? Perfect. All right, so for the record, uh, Chair Early, members of the board, my name is Josh Mahalam, Environment and Policy Program Manager for the Oregon State Marine Board. Um, so today we're going to talk about OSMB rulemaking and the overall state agency rulemaking process. Um, why are we having this conversation? I mean, in many ways, the rulemaking process is, is pretty straightforward. In other ways, it's, it's very oddly complicated. Almost every board meeting, we are talking about rules or considering some part of the rulemaking process. But at least in my recent memory, in my time here, staff and the board have not discussed kind of the overall process. Um, so it seemed like it was, it was a good time to have this discussion um, as a whole and not just about any one specific you know, regulation or, or rulemaking process. Um, I have a lot of information on these slides. I put this presentation together in a way that it could serve as a resource outside of just this meeting. So I would normally not put that many words on slides, but there was trying to do, to, to do two things here. Um, this is meant to spur a lot of discussion. Please interrupt me if you'd like through any of these slides. Again, this is, I think this is a good opportunity for the board to talk about um, the rulemaking process and some of the things that were touched on earlier regarding the members or board members role um, as members of the Oregon State Marine Board and how how they make decisions that subject subjectivity and all of that. So um, we'll start with a question. We can initiate rulemaking and propose rules on anything involving boats whenever we want. So first let's talk about the we. Um, this this came up earlier and I was I was I was antsy because like I want to I'm gonna talk about this. So um, in statute, there is very little distinction between the Oregon State Marine Board members, you all, um, and the agency, the staff. I mean, there are a few things that the board must do. The board must uh, uh, appoint the director and review the director. Um, the board must meet quarterly. Those things are put in statute. The rest of the things that we do are, are based on, on traditional policy type decisions. Um, a lot of that is could be flexible. There is um, an opportunity for the board to kind of direct how how things go. We don't always have to bring a petition to you, for instance. Um, there's a hundred of other examples. We don't have to bring a law enforcement budget. I think we should, and it would be we'd have to have a long conversation about whether we change some of those things. But those things could change at the board discretion. We're not legally bound to that. Um, so back to the question: We can initiate rulemaking. No not on anything we want anytime we want. Um, we must have the statutory authority and most of that comes from two uh, two distinct statutes, um, 83110 and 175. Um, now first, uh, just an overview of Oregon state law. This is sometimes lost on, on some folks and members of the public that I, that I deal with. The white box on the screen there is meant to be like the law, right? Now, the legislature um, and, and a lawmaker was was with us earlier today. You know, they put the statutes, the ORS, in place. Those are my green uh, rectangles on the screen. And then, where the legislature gives us the authority or provides that that jurisdiction, um, state agencies, the Marine Board included, has the ability to then to make Oregon administrative rules, OARs. Um, typically, OARs do one of three things. Um, they may define terms in statutes where there is some lack of clarity. Um, oftentimes, ORS statutes will say, will lay out a process and then say, well, the Marine Board can define that process in rule. So we might do that. Um, and the third thing is, lost by the little square in the bottom right of the screen, um, is regulations that are made based on authority the legislature grants to us. The Marine Board shall or may make rules that do dot, dot, dot. So I mentioned 83110. Um, I handed the board members today uh, a version of our our rule book. Now this is distributed to law enforcement every year. Um, it has some other things. These are mainly for you know law enforcement. Um, it has some things specific to them, but it also has all the applicable statutes and rules. And if you go to the first little tab, 
um, that we put on there. That is the um, powers and duties of the board. Now, I annotated it because when I had them all up on the screen, it made a little tiny font. So I just pulled out the rules ones. But I do think that the board should, at, at some point, make sure you read through those statutory obligations, what, what the legislature, what powers they have given the board. The ones highlighted on the screen are the specific examples in which these are things that we are supposed to make rules on. We have the authority to make rules on what do I saw? marine toilets, it's 14. Um, rules regulating water speed courses. Um, rules about encapsulated polystyrene foam. Those are all things we are specifically supposed to make rules through, and that is because of the power granted to us in 831.10. Um, another one that we use quite often, probably more often than anything else, is regulations for specific areas. This is 831.75, and I think I made that the second, perfect, the second little tab. Um, yeah, the second little tab in those books. Um, and this, uh, to, to briefly summarize, says based on traffic conditions, boating conditions, a number of waterway factors, we have the ability to make local regulations. We have the ability to make slow no wake zones. We have the ability to make that pass through zone. We have the ability to restrict toad water sports in a certain area. All this is derived from the powers that we have um, in 830-175. Hey Josh. Yeah. You're on a roll, so I hate interrupting you. <laughs> Please do. We can make rules. We don't have to make rules. There's nothing that mandates we make a rule if we have an issue, correct? Remember with you, that is mostly correct. There are some situations in wh where we have the, the statute will say we shall make rules. Um, that's actually a perfect segue into, I provided some other examples of places where um, we have statutes that talk about rules. Um, middle of the screen there, for instance, uh, 830-646. The State Marine Board, by rule, shall establish and collect issuance. So there's cases when we have to. For those more general statutes, um, these ones, the powers, these are these are all, there's a may insinuated. You know, we have the authority to, does not mean we must. So it's up, up to our discretion for the most part, whether we make a rule or not. Yes. And is it our uh, philosophy that a rule is the last resort? We try to resolve things before making a rule? So remember, Withy, I... You just took the words out of my mouth from a future slide because I'm going to I would like to talk about some of the things we do outside of rulemaking. Um, it is. I will say it is my philosophy uh, and I would encourage the board to evaluate other options before we, we get to a, a regulatory. Um, we start looking at rules, um, but each board member might have a different philosophy on that. Um, so anyway, like like I was saying and like was, I'm sorry, Colleen, you have a question. OK. No question. <laughs> OK. Um, like I said, there are some other examples in which we have to make rules. The legislature says this is the law, Marine Board. You must clarify this, provide some specific examples, maybe exemptions. Um, and just a few of those are on the screen. Um, I think when I when I search through um, ORS 830, there's 90 some examples of, of language that says Marine Board shall make rules or or um, may make rules so we have broad authority but there are a whole lot of in-betweens right um there, the rulemaking authority can sometimes not be be clear you know we had we've had conversations about whether we are able to require life jackets on children and um, we are pursuing a legislative concept to kind of put that in statute and that was around some questions on whether the marine board had the ability to define readily accessible we did that in in rule um, and there were some questions over whether we overstepped our, our regulatory authority. Um, I put the, the muffling devices up there because um, this one's been questioned a lot and we've, we've sought um, some legislative clarity or, or some clarity from, from our Department of Justice um, saying, you know, does this mean we have authority on all noise coming from boats? Um, boat stereo noise is something that we, we hear about a lot. Um, and at this point, a lot of that guidance has been, no, you have the authority over boat motors that does not give you the broader authority over everything coming from a boat. What does that mean? So if they have a radio on a boat, we don't have authority over how they operate their radio. So, so remember with the I cannot give you a, a yes or no answer because that's never been tested in court. Um, however, our guidance has been that the legislature gives us specific authority over boat motor noise. 
there is an implication that that then does not give us authority over everything else, everything else noise related coming from a boat. So that begs the question on who has the authority? The legislature always has the authority. Yeah. Um, and without any kind of legislative change, um, it would could end up being decided in a court of law. That's the judicial branch. And there's there are so many questionable rulemaking examples. I mean, there's it's not clear whether we have the jurisdiction or any other agency to do certain things. That's that's why we have our court system to make those those decisions. So if somebody's partying on a boat, we really have no jurisdiction over that. It depends if they are in, in violation of some boating laws. There are still, you know, I don't I don't know what this party looks like. If there there could be a, a boating under the influence aspect, right? Um, as far as strictly yelling or music, um, right now there would be no applicable rules in place that would um, prohibit that. Um, and it is questionable whether we could put rules in place to do so. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, and it, those are great questions. I think something that I uncovered in this job fairly recently is how much um, gray area there is between statutes, rules, and, and um, who can do what, who has authority over what. Um, it's uh, So, you know, the recent issue that's come up on the Willamette is anything on the water is the boats uh, or the board, the green board's responsibility. Anything on land belongs to the local community jurisdiction. But what we're saying here is there's still something greater as far as emanating noise from the water. Remember with this, um, yes, and thank you for, that's a perfect segue into the next slide, which is, there is, <laughs> you're helping me, it's fantastic. Um, this is a, a statute that gets brought, brought up quite a lot, and it is saying that no local jurisdiction, counties, cities, can put laws into place that are contrary to ours, to, contrary to things in Chapter 830 or any rules derived from powers within Chapter 830. Um, because there are no regulations in Chapter 830 or rules in our OARs about things outside of motor noise, um, our argument would be that um, a local jurisdiction could put rules in place for things that we aren't that are not covered in our statutes or rules. So in your example, the, the partying example, um, we would contend that, that a local rule could be in place for the non-motor boat noise aspect of it. Okay. But for but for a motor noise, which is the issue that we're going to talk about with the next agenda item, that is very clearly ours. And because of this statute, no no local jurisdiction, Westland, Gladstone, for instance, could put rules in place contrary to ours. Sorry. So I need to distinguish a little bit between boat, no, boat noise and motor noise. There's noise that comes from a boat. It's not just the motor, you know, vibration of the boat. Yeah, other aspects of it. Are we only dealing with the motor noise or are we dealing with the noise generated by the entire boat? All the authority regarding noise from boats is coming from this 830-260 on the screen, which is very specific to um, internal. internal combustion engine noise. Um, now, I am, I, am, I am not a lawyer, and I don't know if I necessarily want to argue this in front of a judge, but an argument could be made that if it's outside of this, that is not, that is not a power that has been given to the Marine Board. So if I have a uh, uh, propeller, it's out of balance, causing a lot of vibration in the boat, which is generating noise, or it doesn't have authority over that. I think we were with you, I think, as Josh has mentioned a few times. So when you, you're getting down to some pretty, you know, the answer would be we don't know until a court would decide some of those minor points. Um, and again, I want to just remind the, the this one is a good example and it's fresh on everyone's mind, but this this presentation is a general presentation, not just a sort of through noise. So I appreciate that, but we do have the issue at hand. I guess mm -hmm. we can talk about that more later. I, mean, with that, I think that's a good idea. We can talk ab about it more later. Um, and Director Warren's point is a good one. There's a whole lot of what we don't know until it goes to goes to a court. Um, we have there's plenty of examples. 
Yeah, I, I mean, leave it. I'd say leave it at that, and then let's get into it when we get when we get to the noise um, issue next. Is the rest of the board okay with that? Yeah. Okay. General discussion. This <clears throat> please. I, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't use this one as a specific example because of the next conversation at hand. Um, so as I mentioned, yes, if, if, if we have rules in place for things, um, no other or statutes in place, local jurisdictions um, are not able to, to put anything in place that are contrary to those. So here is a general overview um, of the, the rulemaking process um, that, that we and all other state agencies um, go through. So the rulemaking, rulemaking proceedings are laid out in statute, and then there are model rules and some further further clarifications that are provided by the AG in rule that then we adopt. So we basically this is this is the rulemaking process. Um, so I think we have done this several times. When many of you have been on the board, we've initiated rulemaking. Typically for the Marine Board, that happens in one of three ways. Um, there's a need identified by either you as the board, we as staff, maybe law enforcement brings something to our attention um, and that we consider potential regulations. Um, every now and then there's a need created by legislation or legal cases. For instance, um, the Toad Water Sports Education Program. There are examples there where that required us to, to then make rules. Um, so then we open up rulemaking that way. Um, or if there is a, an accepted public petition, that always opens, if you accept a petition, that opens up the rulemaking process. Um, that does not mean that you adopt the rules laid out in the petition. It merely opens the process, opens the discussion, um, you say you're now considering um, regulations. So after we initiate rulemaking, we um, we consider what those rules should look like. This is a very, very dynamic, open-ended, um, everything's on the table process. You can consider making regulations and in many ways. Um, we can consult experts, we can you know, form committees, rule advisory committees, which we've done in the past. Um, the, the statutes and, and uh, um, attorney general guidance are very clear, like public involvement in this step in any way that makes sense is is absolutely encouraged. Um, if we get to the point where rules are proposed, um, then there's a process that mainly staff takes care of to make sure that, that we do that formally and, and within the guidelines and statute. And I'll elaborate on that in the next, uh, the next couple slides. And if we actually get to the point where we adopt rules, um, then we file them with the Secretary of State's office and they become state law um, at the, the date of our choosing. Um, the rulemaking process is not necessarily linear. Um, sometimes we get to rules proposed and decide that we maybe need to go back to the drawing board. We go back to considering other rules or we just close the rulemaking process entirely and, and look at other options. That's fine. That's how the process is supposed to work. Um, but you don't always have to close the rulemaking process. Is that correct? No. Officially. Officially, officially no, Cheryl. That's a good question, um, and one that we've 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 asked for some guidance on in the past. Um, rulemaking can can go on not indefinitely, but but for an appropriate a period period of time. I think um, from a policy standpoint, I would say if if we don't intend to to keep working on rules and eventually propose rules, then the the recommended way to go would be to close the rulemaking until we're finally ready to make you know, actually make rules just from a public transparency perspective. Um, Unlike a public petition that has to be acted on within a certain period of time, there's no time limit on open rulemaking. Carol, that is that is correct. I'll lay out the, the petition yeah. process in a couple of slides and okay. that has some clear sideboards. Um, so the next slide is the, the rulemaking close. Um, this <laughs> rulemaking not open absolutely does not mean that OSMB is not working on an issue. Um, like we discussed earlier, we should look at rulemaking is as, as a kind of a last resort after we've exhausted all non-regulatory options. Um, I would say that most of our policy work of the agency, including a lot of the things that we do for conflict mitigation, it does not involve any kind of formal rulemaking. Um, we are, as staff, constantly trying to solve problems that arise um, without going into rulemaking. Um, coordination with our law enforcement partners is a big one. Um, and that's why I don't think the OSM or the voting safety staff knew their picture was going to be on here. But here's a good example of a meeting trying to address one of those issues with some local law enforcement. We facilitate meetings with stakeholders and and and, and try to bring 
people together to, you know, toward common goals. We do a lot of uh, attendance of outside meetings just to make our role clear and what we're looking for and then, you know, try to try to make compromises with others. Um, we also, uh, Brian's group does a great job at this, providing informational buoys and signs to deter some activities. Sometimes a non-regulatory sign, but a, a kind of informational sign can get a lot of, of compliance and mitigate issues. There's the picture on the bottom left there is a great example of some issues that were occurring in Tillamook County fairly recently regarding commercial divers and, and fishermen. Um, and uh, you know, we were able to provide some signage that helped alleviate a lot of those concerns and then help those groups um, make sure everyone was safe on the water without going into some sort of rule making. Um, I would note, however, that sometimes initiating rulemaking does have a, it's a very effective way of gauging public sentiment because for lack of a better way of saying it, it, it gets people's attention. Um, sometimes the new, the prospect of new regulations is needed to kind of energize a user base to provide some meaningful feedback to the agency. So let's say the rulemaking was open um, and we did get to the point where we proposed rules. I'm not going to go through all of the things that we need to do as an agency when we propose rules. Um, that's what you have our, myself, Dorothy, and our other staff to do. But there are, there are a whole lot of things that we made, make, need to make sure happen. Um, there are certain deadlines that we need to put. We need to put things in the Oregon Bulletin. We need to notify our interested parties. We need to notify any potential affected legislators. And we also need to put out this notice. There's a recent one pictured on the right. And there's a whole lot of things that we need to, to answer. Um, for instance, you know, uh, what is what does the rule do? What authority do we are we stating that we are we citing that we have the authority to make this rule? Um, a, a need, the need for the rule, the fiscal impact of the rule, um, and and a fairly recent um, fantastic legislation is we also need to say you know how this will affect racial equity in this state. Any rule that we make, we need to to provide information on on those things. Josh, absolutely sorry. The next to last there. Uh, their line there. If no advisory committee was convened, an explanation of why is the expectation in normally that you will have an advisory committee? Remember, with you, that's a good question too. I don't think the expectation for every rulemaking is that a, a, a advisory committee will be convened. I think I mean, there's, there's the agency discretion there. I think um, for anything that is a complicated topic, a controversial topic. Um, I would say that the recommendation is an advisory committee in, in some way, shape or form is encouraged. I mean, again, the, the statutes and rules are very clear that we should encourage public involvement and a rule advisory committee is, is a great way to do that. So I mean, I'll give you another example for, like we had to make those toad water sports education rules. Um, in an example like that, where legislation requires us to make rules and we are laying out a process that was really already kind of defined in statute, a rule advisory committee there would be probably unnecessary um, because there's not a real lot of substance in it. But for instance, when we were making rules for the lower Willamette a couple years back, um, a rule advisory committee there, which we did use, um, would certainly be um, a good step. Yeah, it's, a, it's a large state. Uh, a lot of different cultures in the state, a lot of uh, diverse ideas and opinions are voting in the state. And sometimes uh, a one statewide rule doesn't apply because of those differences. It'd be nice if we're able to learn what interest there is and what uh, issues there are across the state before we look at a statewide rule. I would think an advisory committee where all of their stakeholders or interested parties are involved before the rule is proposed would be a good idea. Remember with the I don't I don't disagree with you. I think that we have used some of the public comment periods to gauge, you know, what the feelings are throughout the state. And and I think it's a good idea for the agency. I mean, we, we always should um, and do take public comment seriously, and we may use that to inform advisory committees. One, one of my concerns about the, that uh, approach is public comments 
tend to get people lined up against each other and fighting each other, and they're not uh, looking at common interests. So that was that's been my objection uh, in my time on the board. I hate to see all that animosity built between user groups. I'd like to, you know, see us try to avoid that. And if advisory committees are like that, I don't know. I don't get the issues on the table and get people talking to each other before they're looking at a rule and be facing a fear that they're going to be forced into a situation that they don't feel they can live with. Well, idealistically, we, you know, a, a rules advisory committee would would do exactly what what you are hoping it would do, but it doesn't always work that way. And we've seen that even with some of the issues that we've dealt with where rules advisory committees were not productive and um, going back to the public comment or public process was more useful to to creating what we needed to do or what we wanted to ascertain from the public. Yeah, well, so. that's certainly not my first rodeo, so I understand that. But at least you get the issues on the table and you understand the perspectives of the participants. So okay. that's the advantage I see in having the advisory committee. Director Warren? I would say a, a good mentor of mine one day when I was complaining about dealing with hard issues said, you know, when, once you become the director, if the issues get to you, they should be hard or your staff's not doing their job. And I think, remember with me, sometimes if we go back to the slide two or three ago, you know, if you can or can, we do a lot of what you're talking about and solve a whole lot of issues at the staff level that you never see. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And, and you know, good examples. There's again some un unknowing folks end up in a picture, but we meet with a lot of groups all across the state, and we avoid. Janine's a master at it. You know, Randy was, Brian will be as he gets going. You know, we, Josh, we we go to where the problems are. We get groups together. We talk about them, and we solve a lot of problems. By the time they get to the board level issue, a lot of times we've run out of those solutions, and and here we are. And so that's that's another challenge. Yeah, there's no, I don't question that. Yeah. Not at all. I understand there's a lot of work that goes on in the background, and I appreciate the work the board does, that the staff does. So that's not the point. As a board member, though, I would like to know what, uh, what the issues are and you know, what the perspectives are from all the stakeholders and all the participants before I am forced to deal with the issue myself. So that's where I'm at. Remember with you, I, I think you bring up one of the challenges that that I work to overcome for us, and I still I don't think I've been successful in it, is to get all that stakeholder input in some way prior to we getting to the point where we're having board meetings on the, the topic, um, identifying stakeholders that would be interested on on certain issues. Um, and it's something we're going to continue to work on. I mean, I, I take that at your input here seriously. It's um, I wish I had a way to, to gauge interest, know who's interested and, and be able to compel them to actually give me meaningful feedback, which is another thing that we struggle with all the time. Mm -hmm. um, just because someone's interested in something doesn't necessarily mean they're going to weigh in, especially if they're representing some some other group or, or some other state agency. Um, but but you identified a, a challenge that's absolutely. A good one. I think the other challenge in the feedback loop is, Josh, how many Monday mornings is your inbox full of people telling you how great things are going? And that, so you, you hear from five or six people and you think, oh boy, we've got a huge issue. We need to get a group together. We get to this and then you step back and look at it. And it's, it, you know, you don't hear from everyone out there who's just, it's going well. They like how things are going. And so, you know, we, it's a. Balancing. Balancing. I would say that that goes back to something that one of my mentors always told me um, is if you do something good, maybe 10 people hear about it. If you do something wrong, it's like 50. And so again, you know, I'm relying on staff here to kind of be that filter of like, is this really a problem or is this a squeaky wheel? <laughs> Is the board okay if I continue on Please. with because uh, the public comment this ties really into this conversation. Um, so public comment period for any time that we propose a substantive rule change. If it's a housekeeping thing, we don't necessarily need a, a, um, a public comment period, um, but a substantive rule change requires at, the, at a minimum a 28 day public notice period 
Um, we strive to go above and beyond the 28 day whenever we can. Um, sometimes the timing of board meetings and stuff affect our, our timeline. Um, for potentially controversial rules, an opportunity for oral arguments is recommended a, a rules hearing. Um, and if it's a local rule, you know, you do that rules hearing in that locality. Um, and even if we don't schedule a hearing, if it is formally requested by a group of 10 or more individuals, then we are required to, roll, to, to do a rule hearing. Our policy has been and will continue to be if we think that there's going to be any kind of input at all on on a rule that we're doing, we're going to at least provide one. Um, one rule, one rule hearing. Um, and now um, after after the pandemic, we, we, we have the ability to do some of those virtually and, and we're able to get more input that way. And I think people appreciate that. Um, the formal comment period allows all parties, any anyone, um, an equal opportunity to provide their views. Um, and it, it is why we try to we try to be fair to everyone. And, and um, you know, if everyone has that 40 day period in some ways, it can create problems if, if people are outside or able to provide input outside of that period. It just gives some people an unfair opportunity. So I have this this very, very basic table here on the screen uh, about what public comments are and, and what public comments aren't. Um, public comments are they're a great way for us to get some, some substantive input from people that are truly interested in a topic. Um, and, and we are, as an agency, I think we are very good at getting some very passionate input. And for better or for worse, you know, that's we, we, we get a we get a lot of we get a lot of input that way. Um, public comments are incredibly easy to submit. Um, you just send an email to, to Jennifer over here and then, and then that ultimately gets brought to your attention. Um, and public comments are something that you absolutely should consider. Um, it is an important part of the rulemaking process. This is not just a statutory hurdle that we need to do. This is this is an important part of our policy making. Um, however, there are things that the public comment period doesn't really allow us to capture. Um, it doesn't give us that comprehensive look at all sides of the issue because um, we don't get very many comments on, hey, this this looks generally good I'm, and I'm happy with it, but I don't care that much. You know, you're going to get from people that are very polarized by by an issue. We don't hear from happy people all that often, um, which gives me a lot of gray hairs. Um, um, they're also not a great indication of people that might not be directly affected, kind of along those same lines. You know, for instance, on the uh, I use the lower Willamette rulemaking as an example. There is a, a large contingent of fishermen that that use that stretch of river. Um, in talking to many of them, they had opinions, but they were not directly affected by the rules. We, we were really not able to capture their sentiments. We heard from the, the very staunchly opposed and the very staunchly for. Um, capturing that middle ground is challenging. Um, I say they're not difficult to submit. And I, and I say that because the number of comments received now is becoming you know less and less important as as email and social media has lowered the barrier kind of for and the commitment associated with drumming up support and providing testimony it takes very little to get some people motivated to send an email um, to to Jennifer and then ultimately for you for you to read. Um, I can't really advise you on how to consider that further, but it's just we get a lot more comments now um, than we did as an agency a decade ago because it's very very easy to to submit them and it's very very easy to get people excited and the last thing on there is probably the most important one to me is that a public comment period in no way is a a vote again you, we are only hearing from people that have very kind of strong opinions or even know about what's going on I mean, public comments are sent out to our agency's interested parties list um, or the request for public comments that is roughly 700 individuals um, nearly everybody on that list is on that list because of negative interactions with or feelings towards the Marine Board in, at some point. Um, our interest parties list is, is not a bunch of really happy people that think we're doing an awesome job. Um, and it's unfortunate, it, it is what it is. Um, and we do strive, we use other news releases, social media to try to get our opportunities for public comment out there. But again, I, I would never say that it is, it is being disseminated widely um, and we are not hearing from, we are only hearing from one very motivated or maybe two motivated sides, but you're going to miss the middle. Um, a couple other notes on the public comments. Um, input from public officials, whether they're city government, county government, federal government, sometimes um, state representatives and senators um, or law enforcement officers. It's challenging to weigh. 
Um, I'll get in a little bit to kind of your role as a board member in this process and a couple slides, but um, it is, I can't necessarily advise on, on, on how you gauge input coming from different elected officials with different constituencies, but it is something that I, you absolutely should consider. Um, and then one note, we kind of got into this a little bit prior, is that other executive branch agencies are often very hesitant to formally participate in someone else's rulemaking process. Um, we are also that way. Um, if, if DSL has a controversial issue politically, we're probably not going to be weighing in um, if it's kind of their thing. Um, I wish this wasn't the case, but we just can't compel comments or testimony, um, especially if we're dealing with a potentially controversial topic. Um, so it's not that other agencies don't care what they're doing, but they have their own. They got to take care of them, themselves, I guess. So uh, public petition, something that, that we get you know, quite a lot of. This is sometimes misunderstood by the public, but any member of the public may petition any state agency to adopt, amend, or repeal any rule. That is laid out in statute. Um, to be administratively complete, petitions do have to check off certain things. Um, we get many not administra administratively complete petitions. There's an example on the right of one that I got uh, a couple years ago. That's not a petition. That's just that's just an angry email. Um, now, those folks, we will we can say, hey, there is a way to formally you know, do this, but you have to put some work into it. And usually I just I just don't hear back. Um, but we do receive our fair share of administratively complete petitions um, for those. We must invite comments um, specifically. We, we need to get comments or we have to ask about the if there's options that would achieve the substantive goals of the role. Um, that would also minimize the effects on small businesses. That's that's in statute, um, and then some other things that we are we are supposed to consider as we look at a petition. Whether there is a need for the role that's being asked to, or that someone wants to change, um, whether it's too complex, whether it overlaps with other regulations, it kind of forces a mini rule review of the of the role at hand. Um, one thing I want to note: it's unfortunate that. Many members of the public don't don't understand the petition process. The agency gets a lot of blowback because there are some that believe a petition was either initiated by or supported by Marine Board staff or Marine Board members, um, which is not necessarily the case at all. In some cases, it is. Some cases, it's not. Um, but I, I try to clarify to folks that look, we go through a public process for a petition. It does not mean that we support it. It means that it has been brought to us for our consideration and we are seeking comment on it before we consider it. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going forward. Um, but I, I struggle to, to make everyone understand that. So this is on our website. I'm not going to read all this. This is something that one of our staff put together for potential petitioners um, a few years back. Um, and it's just, uh, we provide it to, um, to the public to give them an idea of what they can expect if they petition the Marine Board. Um, I think the, the one thing I'll mention on this is available on our website. The link is, is on this previous page on the bottom. Um, one thing I'd note is that's confusing for folks and confusing even for staff and myself is that an opportunity for comment is required on petitions. But if we initiate rulemaking because of that and then propose rules, there is an additional public comment period required. That that double public comment period can confuse a lot of folks. You know, we get a whole lot of you already asked us what we thought about this. I'm like, yes, but that was just the petition. Now we propose propose rules. Um, and so so we're going to work um, as an agency um, between now and the next board meeting to maybe work through that process and see if we can streamline it for both the members of the public and for the board just to, so we don't have to have these these double public comment periods. <clears throat> so this was my shot, remember with the, at addressing the question that you brought up earlier, um, earlier today um, when Director Warren was presenting. A board member's role is subjective. Um, as an agency, I think we try to balance outside pressures and desires with our stated mission and vision um, that Director Warren went over. Um, and make decisions accordingly with to that balance. Um, there are very few restrictions on how the board members interact with the public. Um, there are certain things that you know you need to be cognizant of. Public records laws are one of them um, that 
certain members shouldn't speak for the board. There's a five member board for a reason. And that if there's three of you together, you're doing a board meeting on a topic. So be very wary of that. There's certain requirements. Other than that, you're, you're able to interact with the public in really any way that that suits your needs. Um, a couple of notes here. Consider that everyone has bias um, and that's including the Marine Board. That's kind of in our mission. Ours, ours is that we care about care about boats and boaters and that will always play into our decision making process. Um, another thing to note is that anti non motorized boater sentiment exists. Anti motorized boater sentiment exists. There's a whole lot of socioeconomic and social issues that sometimes kind of masquerade as boating issues. Um, certain type of boating have their own cultures and some of those unfortunately are becoming less and less compatible with others it seems and creating a lot of kind of social strife. Um, and remember with you, you asked that perfect question earlier, how does the board balance stakeholder needs and versus voting needs? I, I can't answer that. Um, you all have been appointed by the governor of the state of Oregon to, to do just that. Your credentials and experience are why you were appointed. And this philosophical question is, is kind of up to you to determine how that, um, you know, how you operate as a member of the Oregon State Marine Board. This is pretty much the fundamental function of the Oregon State Marine Board. Uh, the first uh, statement there, a board member role is subjective. I would hope that a board member is trying to be objective in making uh, a decision on how they vote, that we're looking at all elements and we're not uh, trying to be biased, although we all had our inherent mm -hmm. classes, as you say, but we're not trying to be biased to our one point of view that we're considering everybody's point of view and being objective in that type of consideration. Remember with you, I don't I don't disagree with that. We're actually I think we're saying the same thing. I, what I wanted to convey here is that um, you as board members aren't completely impartial judges. We're not the judicial branch. The, that that caring about voting and looking out for voting interest, caring about voting safety and voting opportunity should be part of the decision making process for Marine board members. But no, absolutely, impartiality and looking at everything else. I absolutely agree. Okay, I am almost done. Um, something real quick I just wanted to point out because this is part of the of the rulemaking process that we have to do as an agency. Um, there is a requirement for all new rules that are that are made um, that we review them every five years. And um, there's certain things listed on the screen that we have to consider during that review. We've put together some um, materials that we distribute to potentially affected parties to gauge the effectiveness of roles. And we use these to determine whether it might make sense to bring it back to the board. Maybe we need to amend something, repeal something, do something else. Um, so that is built into the rulemaking process. We as an agency are actively doing that. Um, there is an initial review of filed rules by the Secretary of State's office, pretty high level, um, but there's also a more deeper review of statutory authority and a check for conflict with statute and things like that, that um, that happens when the Secretary of State's office says things to legislative um, council. So there is a, um, if we try to put in some wacky rules, I'll probably get an email in a month saying, hey, we cannot do that. These need to be repealed immediately. Can't talk about rulemaking if I don't at least mention temporary rulemaking. Um, so I'll just be very brief. We do have the, um, the authority to make temporary rules uh, if there is a justified extreme need. These rules must be just that, temporary. Um, they can't be in place for more than 180 days and they should only be used when failure to implement immediate rules may result in extreme consequences to the public. For us, that most often is used during wildfire situations, either, either to protect boaters from fire themselves or to um, get boaters out of the way of firefighting efforts like pictured on the left. Um, fairly recently, uh, there was an example in this very area um, when there are wildfires on the road that required the agency to um, stop boating on the rogue river for a period of time um, until those dangers had subsided. So if I was going to take a shot at some final takeaways, I, I hope that you found this presentation helpful. First of all, this was really meant to be a, a resource to you. Um, so some final thoughts. The rulemaking process, there is some rigid statutory sideboards, but there's also a whole lot of flexibility in how we consider roles. Um, there's a whole lot that we do as staff that you as a member don't have to worry about as far as making sure that we follow some of those statutory guidelines, notices, all of that. 
Um, and then lastly, the rulemaking efforts are rarely universally supported. They're almost always those in opposition. This is unavoidable, I think, but transparency and consistency in our decision making is important. And I think failure to do those things can hurt our agency's perception um, and credibility. And uh, with that, I will stop and take any additional questions that we didn't cover during the presentation. Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. That's a great overview of, of rules, rulemaking, and your actually your color coded tabs is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Josh. I appreciate you going through that. And uh, you know, as we continue working with issues, there will be more questions on the process and how we engage in it. So uh, I appreciate you taking the effort to present that to us. I appreciate that, member with the and, and for you and the rest of the board, as we go through some of these rulemaking things, if there are questions about the process or authority, um, I'm happy to to give you all the information that I have. And there are certainly times when I will seek additional you know, legal guidance on some of those, and we'll be happy to share that as well. I do appreciate it. there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that we're not aware of, and, and I can't say enough for the work the staff does, so thank you. Colleen? No questions. Just thank you to Josh for a great presentation. Okay. I have a quick question. Did the noise issue that we have here and did that spark part of this presentation? Member Guzman, that's a great question. And I know it seems like that, but but no, we had this one planned. I started working on this or the idea of this like about nine months ago or so, because it became apparent actually during some of the um Willamette River conversations that that an overview would is would would be good, especially as new members come on. Um, although it does certainly it's a good primer for for getting into the the noise conversation um, that we have upcoming. But no, that was not the that was a coincidence. So really, you were the impedance <laughs> <laughs> or the inspiration, I should say, right? OK, no. yes. OK, so with that, uh, before we get into item G, um, I think we'll take a break for um, do we need a break for lunch? Half an hour or do we want to just do 15 minutes again? I'd like to take a little more time. I need to go get warmed up. Yeah, okay. we'll, close, we'll close some windows and deal with okay. the Yeah. So we will resume um, less the 20 minutes, half an hour? 20 minutes. Fine. 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Right. In 20 minutes. 1235. Yeah. yeah.
Are we set? Okay. Okay. Welcome back to the Oregon State Marine Board uh, quarterly meeting, uh, July 28th. Uh, we are at the Curry County Public Library in Gold Beach, and we are on agenda item number G. So um, we'll turn it over to Josh here in just a second. I uh, just wanted to, to make a couple of important uh, comments or notes, and that is, first of all, thank you very much for the incredible uh, comments that we received during this process, this petition that we received. So um, it was a very good participation and we appreciate everybody taking the time to submit their comments. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Josh. Okay, thank you, Chair Early, members of the board. Um, I will try to briefly summarize um, the relatively lengthy materials that, that you were provided on this and then um, take it to the board for uh, their discussion and consideration. So a very brief background on this topic. Staff began getting complaints about PWC noise around Meldrum Bar um, last summer. A petition with a proposal to address the alleged problem was filed in the fall and considered by the board at the January 2022 meeting. Uh, the board chose to not seek a regulatory solution at that time, but to instead see if a satisfactory solution could be arrived at locally. Um, then the board revisited the issue in April of this year we put a temporary rule in place and opened up the rulemaking process to explore a permanent solution. Not long after that, a second, more comprehensive petition was filed with the Marine Board by another party. Um, the full petition is included in your board book. Um, after that, public comments were solicited on this version for 40 days uh, earlier this summer. In your board book, I've included an overview of boat motor noise regulations in Oregon. Um, this also includes some recent changes that were made in the last five years in which a different petition in 2017 prompted a rulemaking. Um, the impetus for this petition was actually to give officers a practical procedure for evaluating motor noise. There was, there was none prior to, to 2018. Um, this resulted in the creation of a rule advisory committee um, and eventually the adoption of the current rules, which established an 84 decibel shoreline limit um, for motor road noise in Oregon. But back to the current petition, it proposes three distinct rule changes um, and provides some significant supporting documentation for the proposals. In short, the petitioner asked the board to lower the statewide shoreline standard from 84 decibels to 75 decibels to introduce a narrative standard that would allow context to be considered by local law enforcement when considering if a noise disturbance warrants a citation um, and restricts PWCs from engaging in activities that have the potential to generate um, unreasonable noise, including aerials, engine revving, um, and flips. As I said, we solicited public comments for over a month and received substantial input um, on both sides of, of the issue. Supporters of the petition voiced concerns about noise coming from motorboats in general. They also expressed frustration specifically with the Meldrum Bar area, and a few had concerns about some larger boats being operated on the Columbia. Um, this group of folks also correctly pointed out that Oregon's shoreline standard is higher than most states and that boat noise should be able to be addressed by local regulations and not only by a statewide agency. Those opposed to the petition expressed frustration with homeowner influence on boating regulations. Um, they also took issue with the subjectivity of the narrative standard um, and believe that a statewide response to what they see as a local issue is unwarranted and excessive. Um, it is notable, though, that many of those against the overall petition did support the current temporary rule in place for the lower Willamette River of a 75 decibel limit as measured from the shore. A few other interesting and significant pieces of input to note, um, leadership from local city government supported the petition, as well as three different lawmakers from that area. Um, however, a broader contingent of state lawmakers, most of which with districts far from the, the Portland area, um, came out against the petition, especially the, the proposition of statewide rules. The State Sheriff's Association also opposed the petition and provided a comment regarding how the narrative standard would be problematic from their point of view, um, from a law enforcement perspective. Um, so a few comments, considerations from, from staff, um, and then I will, I will turn this over to the board. Um, the character characterization of Oregon's 
as the, the loudest state in the, the West is somewhat misleading as Idaho and Montana are regulations are, are local and sporadic and not statewide. And several other nearby states have higher or no limits at all for, for motorboat noise as measured from the shore. But like I said earlier, um, ours is higher than the majority of states in the US. Um, I also wanted to try to give the board a sense of how many boats would be affected, but that's tricky for this because this the shoreline standard is uh, an evaluation of how a boat is operated and not a measure of the, the boat itself because it takes into consideration you know, how the idle versus um, full speed and distance from shore, much bigger factors than the actual boat. Um, however, using our registration data, my estimate is that there's roughly or over 17,000 inboard jet boats and old PWCs that have the reasonable potential when operated normally to be in violation of a 75 decibel limit when measured from shore where these boats normally operate. Um, it should also be noted that many of the LE boats, some of which we were all on yesterday, um, certainly have the, the potential to operate well in excess of 75 decibels, um, especially on narrower rivers when, when far distances from shore are not attainable. Um, to close, based on the comments both for and against the petition, staff does not recommend statewide rules. People outside of the affected area don't seem to see problems in their areas, while supporters, um, those in, in support of the petition, mostly reference the initial local issue that spurred this initial conversation. Staff also recommends against pursuing the narrative standard, and that is largely based on the pretty strong input from the Sheriff's Association and from, from law enforcement in general. Um, we also do not recommend banning the aerials, flips, engine rev revving. Um, I think if the board would like to further regulate noise, there are more straightforward paths to do that um, and eliminating all different aspects um, of operation that might be unwarranted. So based on those considerations, um, I think there are three reasonable paths the board may take, although the board can certainly go in other directions. Uh, one would be to make the temporary rule permanent as is, that is 75 decibels when measured from shore from Willamette Falls to the Waverly Marina. That puts it, that's consistent with the, um, the current no wake surfing zone directly upstream of the current pass through zone. Another option would be to keep that temporary rule framework, but to modify it either by expanding or contracting the locations in which it's used, um, or also potentially expanding it to other types of watercraft. The current rule is just in place for personal watercraft. Um, and then the third option would be to let the temporary rule expire and to close rulemaking and work on the issue in other ways. So that is, uh, that's my summary, Chair Early, and I, I kick so, it to you. So just to be clear to begin with, um, we have kind of two issues here because we have a petition in front of us, but we also have open rulemaking right now. Is that correct? Okay. That is correct, Chair Early. Mm -hmm. um, the goal of a petition is to open rulemaking. So procedurally, we could have outright de denied the petition and just continued with the rulemaking. But because this gave an opportunity to get some more public input into some, some ideas, we chose to solicit input on it. Um, my suggestion to the board would be determine how the board would like to proceed on this issue, and then we will make the decision on the petition based on the board's direction. Okay. Colleen? Yeah, thank you. I was going to move that we reject the petition and move forward with voting on rulemaking. Okay. I'd like to have a discussion first before we jump to that. And, uh, and we, we can. I mean, if somebody wants to second it or I'll, if somebody doesn't I'll, want to I'll second it, her motion. <clears throat> then we can have some discussion on that. <clears throat> so thank you. Did you want to add some comments? I mean, I, I think it goes without saying we've got a lot on the table here and it just feels like we should address the issue at hand, which was the rulemaking rather than the petition. They just seem a little duplicative to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, Craig, you had some comments? Well, let me start with, uh, I'm a little confused about what rulemaking we're talking about. Back in, uh, what, in April we met? <laughs> We we're talking about the uh, temporary rule, and we we're applying it only to a very localized area. At that time, we voted to open rulemaking. 
I didn't think we were talking about statewide rule. I thought we were talking about Portland metro area and only having this 75 DBA, DBA applied to that area. So I need a little clarity on what we've opened rulemaking on. I was quite surprised to have all these statewide comments come in when I thought we were just talking about the Portland metro area. So Josh, you want to go ahead? Yeah, remember with the, I think the initial rulemaking, the initial intent in April was to look at this narrow area. Um, the comments that we see were in response to the petition, which does have changes to statewide rules, and that's what, what garnered all the, the statewide response. Um, I believe the initial intent of the board was to continue to focus local, um, but I don't know if that was explicitly stated. I mean, the rulemaking was to address motor boat noise. If the board would wanted to expand that to statewide or keep it local right now, that's the board's discretion. So when we open rulemaking, <clears throat> Did we open up for the entire state or we were just talking about the Portland metro area? So if you'll let me, according to the minutes from the last meeting, so you made a motion to open rulemaking and start the process to amend OAR 2500010120 as recommended by the communities of Gladstone and Clackamas County. So that would have made it statewide. Then. No, no, this the very narrow area. Okay. Yes. It's the narrow area, so that's what the rulemaking was that we that we put into to place. Okay. The statewide came through the petition that was submitted to us that we by um, by procedure have to solicit comments on additionally. So the feeling is that the petition did open up the statewide. Yes, because that's what part of the petition was. So and that's so Colleen has has made a motion to dispense of the petition at this time so that we can deal with the rulemaking that we currently have open. So I've read the petition. I'm not sure that was petitioner's intent, but maybe it was. Um, okay, so that's where we're at. Okay, so our, <clears throat> this may be a question for Jennifer since you're the our rules expert, right? Rulemaking, the intent of the rulemaking opening in April was the, the small area in Clackamas and Multnomah County area. The petition hasn't been accepted, so it has not de facto opened rulemaking for the statewide. Okay. And so if we reject the petition, that aspect is gone. The petition, the second petition, yeah. Okay. So thank you. When we reject, Sorry, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear her. Oh. Could you repeat? Mm -hmm. you might have someone with a louder voice. Okay. okay. She she said she said yes. Yeah. So by um, let me. Let, you want to go ahead? Okay. And sit. So we have not accepted the petition yet. Our intent in April was rulemaking for that section of the Lower Willamette. So that is what rulemaking is open. We have to accept the petition. We have not de facto open statewide rulemaking because we have not yet accepted the petition. So if we choose to reject the petition, statewide rulemaking does not open. Thank you. That's what I thought was said, but I could only hear you. So I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> In my mind, I would like to accept the petition as it applies to the Portland metro area and not in kind go into a statewide rule. That would be my objective. But in the end, what I would like to do is see the local community be able to administer policy within their community to affect uh, the citizens in that community, which I guess is the same thing as uh, what we're saying we opened up the uh, rulemaking on. Yes. I want to support the community and I want to support their ability to manage and support the citizens within their community. Now, we talk about the, these other states and the rules they have. I think the intent of each of those states is to mitigate the excessive noise levels uh, impact on their citizens. Uh, you speak about some states don't have any. Well, that's not entirely true because say Alaska, for example, they I resided in for almost four years. 
Excessive noise is not coming from boats. Excessive noise is coming from snow machines. So they have the same rule for snow machines statewide, 75 dBA, 50 B. The intent here is governments are trying to manage the noise levels that their citizens are exposed to. In this uh, particular state, the rural communities aren't incurring excessive boat noise. You know, I really appreciate it. <coughs> day on the river yesterday, I always like being on the river, but I appreciated it from several aspects. I saw a lot of courtesy on the river. I saw people treating each other with respect and uh, trying to be concerned and courteous to how they impact other boating activities on the river, especially from uh, our particular uh, Marine Shear uh, area from uh, Lane County. And he took eight strides to make sure he wouldn't impact the others. And that kind of courtesy and respect on the river would probably eliminate the need for any regulation or rule. And that would be very nice to see. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. What we do have is a lot of uh, people trying to utilize uh, confined space. And there needs to be a way to regulate that so everybody's able to enjoy it. And I, I think the best ones to observe that and observe the impact on uh, the community is the local government. Uh, so that's why I hesitate to dictate statewide how people should behave and act on the river. Uh, Curry County, from what I can see, doesn't need a uh, shoreline standard. I would even propose eliminating the one we have established. Uh, I was very, very impressed with the uh, large uh, charter boats, uh, Jerry Rogue boats and those other ones. They made almost no noise on the river. I could uh, see as they uh, moved up and around the river, you could hardly hear. I was also impressed with the inboard jets that the sheriffs were operating. You know, I had my sound meter, in my, which is my ear. And I can swear, uh, if they were 50 feet away, uh, they were much quieter than my vacuum cleaner. So uh, I can't see where they were violating any of the 75 dBA standard. But that's just uh, measurement by my ear, pretty inexact. Um, point is, you don't have a large residential community living on the road here. So there's really no need to apply a standard that you would put in place in the Portland Metro. Uh, in uh, Golden Beach. So, uh, say what I will, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I also want to point out that the city of Portland has a watercraft noise ordinance. They've had it since 1991 and it's established 75 dBA as a shoreline standard. I think I provided that to you earlier, uh, Josh. So, they have something in place now. Is it enforceable because they don't have jurisdiction? But they have a standard. So they're trying to manage the noise level in their communities. Uh, I would like to see us support that. Uh, also look at the state of Washington. The state of Washington has what's called a uh, shoreline uh, management program. And they've established a program called statewide. And within this program, they uh, provide for local communities to establish how they manage uh, boating activity and other activities along the shoreline. And if I could, I'll just read from the Department of College and website in the state of Washington. Shoreline master programs are local land use policies and regulations that guide use of Washington shorelines. SMPs apply to both public and private uses for Washington more than 28,000 miles of lake stream wetland and marine shorelines. They protect natural resources for future generations <laughs> provide for public access to public waters and shores, and plan for water dependent uses. This allows local communities to come up with their own management plans that's uh, best suitable for their community. You know, a place like uh, Spokane, Spokane River. You know, they, have, uh, they don't allow motorized boating activity through the city of Spokane on the Spokane River. But that's just kind of similar to Bend, where the Marine Board has decided not to allow uh, motorized boats on the river, Shoots River, as it goes to uh, Bend, as we saw in our last meeting. If you did allow motorized boats, uh, you would hear noise issues from the city of Bend, I can guarantee it. 
So there is jurisdiction that's been used by the read board to control noise. Maybe it wasn't the intent uh, to do that, but that was a result. So why not allow these communities uh, on the Willamette to manage uh, their noise, whether it be on water or land, uh, and not force other communities to do the same thing because of the statewide standard. So in the end, I think we ought to accommodate uh, what's being requested in the petition for those communities. Okay, so right now we yeah, again. Actually, sorry, I just want to clarify. We we actually have a motion about the petition, and not it doesn't have anything to do with the with the rule okay, making. So we have what I'm trying so, to do. Okay, I, you're what I'm to trying to do is propose an end result. I'm not sure how to get there. I'm I'm willing to withhold my comment until we take a vote on this, but I want to address something that Craig just. Said. Go ahead. Do it. Okay, yes. so you're citing Washington law, the Shoreline Management Act, stuff in Washington State. That's great. Oregon actually has similar rules under OAR 660 that are the statewide comprehensive planning rules. And there are water, there's shoreline, and there's the Willamette River Greenway, and there's all that kind of stuff. But the issue is we have statutory authority over motorboat points, which is not technically allowed to be covered under the OAR 660 plans that the states do because that's not their statutory authority. So again, what I was trying to say is I would like to get to a point where we can provide those communities that are requesting that relief to the noise that's being generated by boats. Now, maybe we don't have the authority to just outright give them that that uh, ability, but we could have we could adopt a standard that provides for it, as we're talking about here, as is proposed in the petition. Did you want to respond to that? I I guess. You respond to that, but I just want to throw a piece in there too. I think one thing, remember with you to keep in mind is everyone in Oregon, I own the Rogue just as much as the person who lives right here in Gold Beach owns the Rogue. Um, and I own the Willamette every bit as much as the person that owns the Willamette. Our waters are public waters, they're state waters. And yes, we heard from some of the local officials, but we also heard from people that live there and use the water and recreate that don't support this. And I would offer that that's why I think the Marine Board exists is because there, there's a strong desire in Oregon for our public resources to, to belong to all citizens. And so um, I I just think that's, some, that's, that's always an interesting philosophical debate, right? Is how much does somebody local get to control what happens on state water, state lands? and um, you know, public access, public waters, state waters, that's, that's pretty important in Oregon. And okay, yeah, I don't disagree with that. But how are those people impacted? Let's consider that. First of all, are they users of that water? Yes, that water belongs to them. Are they users of that water? And are they using it in such a manner that causes uh, excessive noise? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think so, and they still can use it regardless, as long as they use it within the provisions uh, that we provide. And I think the reason, just one follow up, Secretary, the reason you exist, the reason you're a board, rather than just giving local authority, like you talked about Washington and some states that it's county by county regulation, is when Oregon constructed the Marine Board back in 1959, they said we want one body all across the state of Oregon thinking about all those things, thinking about the local communities, but thinking about the people that come from outside of those communities, thinking about all of the state waters and how they're managed, which is why in Josh's presentation, there was the piece that there's that very clear law that just, I mean, right out of the bat says, board, you can't give your authority away. Well, you, okay, so. but in Washington, they haven't given their authority away. It's still a state level authority. They've established minimum guidelines and then asked the uh, local communities to preserve those minimum guidelines, and if they want to go beyond that, they can. Now, I understand Washington is not our credit, but there ought to be a way that we can support local communities through whatever means so that we provide them what they're asking for right now without a major impact on the voting community. 
in my view. And, and I believe that's what we're doing here. I mean, we've got an open rulemaking that's dealing with a with a local issue that's uh, that we're you know, trying to to help to to provide some support. But ultimately, we are managing public waterways. I I concur with you, uh, Chair Early. I think the process we're going through right now is that process. Um, to get to where Washington is, it would require a statutory change. That eight thirty forty is a legislative mandate that it all goes through us and we cannot even that minimum because we have had conversations you know with legal counsel on this before um our authorities there are there are our boon and also our burden at times i mean it is our mandate that we consider local regulations so I, we work with communities all the time um this is another example where hey you want you want a boating change in an area near your community this is how you do it and then it is on on the marine board the reason the board exists to consider that input, consider the interests of voters and non-voters in the rest of the state, and make decisions accordingly. Laura, I mean, I think again, <clears throat> for local communities to be putting a noise ordinance out that covers over voting, that has to go through LCDC and go through a whole not only statutory change for our authority, but a statutory change for that organization and the rules that they promulgate on the states as regards to land use. So back to the motion on the table here. We have a motion to deny the petition and um, then then continue on with the, the next part of it, which would be the open rulemaking. So is there any discussion on the motion regarding the, the petition and the denial of the petition? Okay, seeing as there is none, we will go ahead and take a vote on denying the petition at this time. So um, let's do a roll call vote, please. Member Moran. Aye. Member Jackson. Aye. Member Guzman. Aye. Member Ruby. Okay. Chair Early. Aye. So we have denied the petition, but we we are not ignoring the issue because now we will have a discussion regarding our open rulemaking. So member Moran. Yes. Since that was part of what you brought yes, forward. Sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, I think we should review the rule that we had discussed at the last meeting and and make a decision on whether or not we want it to continue. So to rephrase what Member Moran said, I'd like to make a motion that we take the temporary rule that we've put in place at the last meeting and make it permanent. OK, so we have a motion to take the temporary rule and make it permanent. Do we have a second? Uh, before we go there, can we read the rule? Sure. And Chair Early, Josh, may both of just to make sure at this meeting, if that's the direction the board sets, then we have to do that rulemaking process to just finish up and bring it back in October. Um, is that correct, Josh? Or could we we at a spot where we could actually put on the rule today? Uh, if the board chose to direct us to propose that, that rule, um, we could given that there's already been significant public comment and consideration um the board, the board could direct staff to then after the public comment period um unless new significant information comes up the staff could do it prior to the october board meeting but that again that would be at the discretion of the board the board could also choose to make sure that they have one more chance to review before final adoption in october so to be clear we would have to do the public information gathering but at the conclusion of that we could with board direction put the rule in place without an additional vote Yes. So even though we already have open rulemaking, because you don't have a, an exact proposed rule, is that correct? So you would be proposing the temporary rule to become permanent, which clarifies the rulemaking. It does, but that, that would be a proposed permanent rule, and then it goes into that 28-day minimum public comment period. It has to be posted, has to be, legislators have to be notified, so there's still a time period before okay. we, we can't adopt permanent rules today. Okay. 
OK, so clarification on that then. And uh, so Member Jackson made a motion. Do we have a second? Uh, one, one moment, Member Withy requested the rule be, be Oh, oh be read. I, I apologize. Um, the current temporary rule states that a person must not operate a personal watercraft in a manner that exceeds 75 dBA measured as specified in the shoreline sound level measurements procedure for recreational motorboats, J1970-201102, on the Willamette River from Willamette Falls, River Mile 26.6, .6, downstream to the Waverly Marina, River Mile 16.9. That rule, um, it was 180 days. It does expire on October 3rd of this year. So if we open up rulemaking, the earliest we could put a rule in place would be the next uh, meeting, October 25th? No, because our rulemaking is currently open. We are clarifying the rule. So it would be 28 days of public comment, and then it could become permanent. We wouldn't have to vote on it to make it permanent. No, we, if, we, if that's what our direction is. So I'll, I'll start looking at the calendar. Looking at the calendars and dates of the week. Right. And some no, because I, I, know how, I know how this works. If, if the board, if the board gave us a, a said, you know, make this the temporary role permanent, um, we we empower staff to to go through that process, adopt the rules. We could adopt those rules on October first, um, which would be before the temporary rule. So we could eliminate any kind of. Uh, period where the oh, rules were not in place. That's right, because it's 49 days for the legislature. Right, right. And then yeah. things also have to be put in place for the first of the month. So this is not a great time to try to get something into the Secretary of State by the first of the month. So what that would look like would be a comment period through September and October 1st would be the first time we could. So before the temporary rules would expire. Yeah. Okay. And then this rule would be without the narrative standard. Right. That they've requested. Is that correct, Judge? The current temporary rule makes no mention of the narrative standard. And this rule will continue to be specific to that. Mm -hmm. area. From the Willamette Falls to the Waverly Marina. Okay. And that is specific for personal watercraft. That that's the language in the temporary rule. So do we have a second to the motion now that there's clarity? I'll second the motion. Okay, so the discussion then regarding the uh, making the temporary rule permanent. So, question for Josh <clears throat> or um, possibly Brian. We put this temporary rule in place in April. We had an exceptionally high in cold water years, so people weren't even using Melbourne Bar until early July, late June, early July at the earliest. Um, have there been any actual citations issued under the rule or any warnings or any has an and since this was basically targeted at a small handful of users? Has that you has that user group actually even been in play this year? Um, Member Jackson, I'll answer, and then Brian, if you'd like to weigh in with anything further, um, please do. You might have more data. Um, to my knowledge, no warning cita citations or contacts have occurred regarding this specific rule. Um, now, in April, I thought we'd have a great opportunity to evaluate the temporary rule. Um, and then, as you said, Meldrum Bar was underwater for um, most of the spring and early summer. Um, as the time of this writing, I had not heard a single thing about that area. Um, that changed as of last weekend, and I know that there that at least some individuals were complaining about uh, the, the personal watercraft operator um, or a group of those operators that were out. To my knowledge, there was not a, a law enforcement interaction, but I do not know that for sure. Um, Brian, looking at you, do you have any? I concur with that. Okay, um, so that's 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 what we that's pretty much the only evaluation experience we had with the temporary rule. Thank you. No, we did peer public comment earlier today regarding the um, increase of use with Melbourne Bar and this particular problem. So, and that sounds like it was pretty recently that it ramped up. 
And member Jackson, one thing we encourage folks to do is to get a hold of their local marine patrols when there are issues and that we we did, I guess, get a test that system and the folks involved were able to contact and then the law enforcement was able to do an evaluation and triage their time and decide how to respond accordingly. Just like they would for any other issue. So this rule would be limited to part of the alignment. Uh, there is no reason to extend it uh, to the lower alignment additionally. Um, that's not no. The motion is is to just make what we have as the current temporary rule a yeah, permanent rule. But and and then the question we is: it, Is there any justification to expand it? I'm if, looking at Josh to, if we were going to do that, which he put in in the board book, then um, then we would need to open or expand the, the rulemaking and would probably need to go out for a longer period of time, would be my guess. Uh, Terry, we don't necessarily have to go out for a longer period of time. We have to do that 30 day, okay. 28 day anyway. Um, I think we do that um, regardless if the rulemaking stayed the same or was expanded. Um, remember with you regarding the question of justification, I'm not sure I can necessarily answer that. I mean, there is the pass through zone right below this area that already stricts this kind of activity with PWCs. Um, so really this would this role in essence really goes downstream to the Hawthorne Bridge where we don't have the restrictions on toad water sports or anything. Um, and then as far as upstream, the Newberg is, is the Newberg pool, which is also which is already the most heavily regulated stretch of water in this whole state. Um, so I, I'm not going to say whether it's justified or not, but I guess those are the realities. My concern is we have residential communities along the entire stretch of the river, and this rule will only apply to part of them. Yeah, Jackson. One of the other issues is once you hit Waverly, the river becomes substantially wider. And so, and the topography surrounding the river is a lot different than it is upstream of that. So, the whole concept that you've got kind of a rock wall bowl has been expanded out and it goes to much more shallow and very different topography and geography and geology and all those sorts of things. Um, that the noise, there's not as much noise. There's also a lot more urban noise that sort of has that white noise masking effect once you get start getting closer down towards Waverly and past the solid bridge. So river width and terrain and topography are very different. I would like to see us just stick with the temporary rule becoming a permanent rule at this time. And okay. then what's your rationale for that? Um, because because the Newburgh pool is extremely regulated already, and we heard from several of those people on there that, you know, that, that they're kind of a little bit tired of regulations. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I'd like to see communities try to work this out within themselves for, rather than go to the regulatory framework. Um, and then also on the downstream side or Waverly, sorry. Um, then we've got the, the pass through zone right there, and that's also heavily regulated right through there. So um, I just like to keep this more of a, a localized type of a solution at this time. That's my rationale. Okay. So my concern is you have various communities. Some are within this area of the new rule and some are not. And then you say work it out among themselves. How do they do that when they have different rules for different communities? I might add, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I might add, just as a reminder, if, if the idea is to, to solve the problem locally and direct it at the issue, some of the uniqueness of these PWCs that are operating that are causing the noise and the angst in the area, and the board heard videos and, and instantly said, yeah, this is a problem we want to address, is they, they need access to fuel very, very frequently. And they can't get very far from shore, which is why Meldrum Bar became such a, a great place for them to go. And and then the areas below Waverly, um, Member Jackson, you can help me out, but I think there's only Willamette Park right there. Um, and that's that's in the passer zone. So somebody couldn't sit and do repetitive passes anyways. So there you there is an example. So um, Melbourne Bar provided an opportunity for people to just back their rigs right down, launch their PWCs, be close to their fuel tanks or, you know, their gas cans. Kind of a unique situation there for them.
Um, I'd like if it's the right time to go in a little bit different direction. Was there more discussion on that? Um, well, no, we have a motion on the table, no, so I'm still talking about this. Okay. Um, narrative standards. Yeah, I'm looking at the operating rules currently for G six, and it's uh, T fifty dash twenty one dash thirty, and it's paragraph five. I consider this an existing narrative standard. It says every personal watercraft should at all times be operated in a reasonable and prudent manner. Maneuvers which unreasonably or unnecessarily endanger the life, land, or property, including but not limited to weaving through congested vessel traffic, jumping in the wake of another vessel, unreasonable, unreasonably or unnecessarily close to said vessel, or when visibility around said vessel is obstructed and swerving at the last possible moment to avoid collision, shall constitute unsafe or reckless operation of a vessel. I consider that a narrative standard. And then later on, it uh, says a person who owns a personal watercraft, or this is paragraph, the paragraph 13. A person who owns a personal watercraft who has charge or over or control of personal watercraft must not authorize or normally permit that personal watercraft be operated by a person under 16 years of age, so forth, so on. That's not the one I really want. I really want subparagraph 15. A person must not chase, harass, molest, worry, or disturb any wildlife with a personal watercraft except while engaged in lawfully angling or hunting or trapping such wildlife. Again, I consider that a narrative standard. And by the way, it says wildlife, it doesn't say humans. Yeah, I would think humans ought to be included. Uh, those are existing narrative standards that I hope the sheriff is enforcing. So when they say they're opposed to narrative standards, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Remember with you, I concur with your assessment that those are both narrative standards. Um, we it is clear to that that those standards do already exist um, to law enforcement across the state. It's their discretion on if they use those, if they choose to, to prosecute based on those statutes, um, that is law enforcement discretion outside of us. But yes, I concur. Those are narrative standards. And I would think the existing narrative standards could be used to address the flipping and other activities that the PWCs are engaged in. Better with you, I again concur, but again, that is law enforcement discretion and they, they choose to interpret it how they'd like for their own communities. Uh, and then additionally, along the same lines, uh, these boat craft are required to be muffled. If you're doing leaps and stuff, then uh, your boat is no longer muffled like it was designed, in my view. Uh, so it would that be a violation of the muffling requirement? Because they're expected to be operated all the time with the mufflers in operation. I remember with you, I think it's a gray area, but I think the argument could certainly be made. So maybe I can ask Brian, if you have a boat that's doing the lead at the PWC, would you agree that boat is not properly muffled? Remember with me, I understand your question. You're asking if a boat or PWC comes out of the water and it has an underwater exhaust and then it's not out of the water, it would be not proper to muffle. The general consensus would be correct. So we already have that in place uh, in our muffling standard. So I wonder if that could be used to cite people who are uh, doing the uh, activities that are causing the noise. I think that would be up to the individual um, law enforcement agency that would be in the area. I mean, that, that it's it's out of our jurisdiction, really. We well, ask them to enforce these laws, so. I know, I'm trying and, to ascertain yeah. if the additional narrative standards would be required from what we already have. Yeah. There, the fact that the Sheriff's Association wrote in and said that they would not support a narrative standard related to noise brings a whole lot of weight to me mm -hmm. um and yeah we have the muffling law and so if a sheriff said you're doing aerials your mufflers out of the water your boat is inappropriately muffled i'm citing you i don't see a need to make a second 
even more subjective rule than one that is actually pretty black and white. Your muffler's not being operated properly. Here's your citation. So I, between what the Sheriff's, Rec Sheriff's Association has stated and the fact that we already do have the rule in place that they can use, I can't support an narrative standard. Well, you know, and I also consider that the sheriffs, uh, elected officials in their particular county, and I would think their citizens could influence them probably more than we could to enforce uh, any standards that are in place. And I would think the elected officials in their particular community could also have some influence upon them. So uh, maybe we ought to leave that to the local officials. Director Warren, did you have something you wanted to add there? I, I do. I just want to add just a little bit to Member Jackson's comments from the Sheriff's Association because the Sheriff's Association was concerned that their letter was misconstrued mis, uh, by some of the public comment that they saw. So I want to make sure it's clear. It is, it is very unique for the Sheriff's Association to write into us. And one of the uh, ideas, they didn't just say we're not going to enforce this. I mean, I know that's just the summary version of it. They, they had some real concerns around the equity, and they've been doing a lot of work across the state and police on equity and the subjectivity of this and the context and deciding that, um, you know, that that lends itself sometimes to some equity challenges. And that's an area they're our partner. They're the experts in law enforcement. They've been doing this work to change how they interact with their communities. And so it, I just want to make sure because, again, I think the Sheriff Association was concerned from some of the public comments that people didn't understand their position. And it, it wasn't just they wouldn't enforce it. It was that, that they saw some challenges around some of the enforcement so, to do it. But I'd like to understand that, Mark. What do they mean by equity? What's, what's uh, where's the equity missing? Is so, that allowing somebody to do flips and turns? So there's talks around like a reasonable standard or a reasonable person and some of those things. Josh, do you want to, you look like you wanted to jump in. So. I don't. <laughs> Thank you, Director One. I don't know if I want to jump in, but I, I yes, I, I mean, I will. I, I heard some concerns from from specific officers, too, on, 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 you know, they're very careful about looking like they're targeting certain types of individuals, certain groups of individuals for certain things. Sure. Um, they more and more would prefer things to be very black and white because it protects them um, in, in court cases and things where it may look like they are, are, are subject, subjectively judging some people more than others. Is, is is really a concern for them. And I, and I think it should be, and I understand where they're coming from. Um, we get a lot of complaints regarding, um, we were talking about boat music earlier. We get a lot of complaints about certain types of music. Uh, the sheriff's deputies certainly want, don't want to be out there determining what types of music are okay versus what's not. Like that, that becomes a, a real challenge for them. But another concern is uh, putting an undue burden on uh, sheriffs they're having to carry sound meters and be at a place of violation when it occurs to the sound meter. You know, how reasonable is that? Whereas, you know, if they observe poor behavior, they can address that by, you know, stopping that boat and educating them, you know, like we've talked about, uh, talking to them, uh, allow that person to know they're being, uh, they're, they're concerned about what they're doing and performance and, and pointing out to them it's affecting other people. Uh, they're in standard to allow them to do that, would it not? No matter what you would. I would, I would actually point to the narrative standards that you've already brought up that are currently in the rules. I mean, I, 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 you made a great point that the sheriffs are elected officials that are much more beholden to their own constituents than they, they are to us and other people in their, their community. Um, I think some of that local control that we talked about, yes, we cannot cede over our authority, but there is law enforcement discretion within their counties goes a long way in, in giving law enforcement some, some control. I mean, uh, in, this, in this situation, um, there, there probably could be rules or, or, or statutes or even just, you know, there could be contacts made to dissuade certain activities. That's all, that's all local control already happening. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's other stuff, but I think I'll stop here.
Pauline, you good? Nothing more from me. Thank you. Okay. I just, just I guess last question, and if, if this was already said, I just didn't get it. I apologize, but so now I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, page two eighty three about the muffler. So how come that hasn't been able to try to reduce the noise from this specific location? I mean, how come law enforcement hasn't really used that rule to address? Member Guzman, I law enforcement discretion and, and I cannot speak to how they prioritize certain issues. Um, I will say that I mean, you saw from um, Brian's wonderful presentation earlier, Clackamas County does uh, the biggest number of, of contacts in the state. Um, they also have a very, very challenging state in terms of different waterways with different kind of uses. Um, and, and Brian mentioned some of their their priorities changing and their priorities might not necessarily be ours. and and their priorities are what they are. They're the ones in charge of their state. I, I can't I can't speak to your question specifically, but because I don't know how the sheriffs make decisions, but um, they have their own discretion. I, I would add to that. We did do what about a year's worth of work with the local communities and the law enforcement. Talk to them about it and, and Janine went out and talked to facility owners about these are some ways we think you could do this without a Marine Board rule. The, board initially about a year ago and said staff try to solve this without a rule yeah and what came back was that it would help the local enforcement if there was a clear rule that they can enforce now difficult and will they do it every time and, and they've got resource constraints and all those things sure um but i don't remember if that's one that we had asked about being enforced or not but we pointed out a few that we thought might have applied and, um, in that year we were working with them on that enforcement piece this is probably a question to my good Brian or somebody. Okay, so given again the situation we're talking about, which the park is in the city of Gladstone, the waterway jurisdiction is Clackamas County Sheriff. Can a terrestrial police department, e.g., Gladstone Police Department, issue a citation for inappropriate muffler use in this situation? I can answer that one, Brian. Member Jackson, the answer is absolutely yes. Thank you. They can enforce state laws as well as their local ordinances. Thank you. Okay, so the motion is to make the temporary rule permanent. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, Jennifer. Member Moran. Aye. Member Jackson. Aye. Member Guzman. Aye. Member Lindy. Aye. Chair Early. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much, Josh and Brian, Director Warren, for all weighing in on everything there. We appreciate it. And so now we are down to uh, informational item, which is the 23-24 board meeting dates. Director Warren. Uh, yes, Chair Lee, member of the board. So we have, this is the first time you're seeing these dates, so we're proposing them um, as our slate of meetings for the next two years. One of the things that we're trying to do is make sure we touch all the corners of the state and you might notice we do two in a row in Salem in 23. That's simply just because that's a full legislative session. And if you do it outside of the Salem area, there's a decent chance that at the last minute, myself or Josh or both of us wouldn't be able to attend the board meeting because we'd have a legislative obligation. And so um, we think this, we, we as staff talked about where could we do good tours, teach stuff, um, let you know what the board's doing. The only thing I'd add is that we will always commit to having the day before the board meeting something that would be of interest to the board. So if you're able to hold time the day before, our commitment is always, it won't always be a jet boat right on the road because that's pretty cool, but you know, we'll, we'll always have some, some good stuff for you to do the day before. So if you hold those dates and you can hold the day before as well, that'd be great. 
So on June 28th and 2023, that looks like a good day to go out of the port of Newport on somebody's boat that we know. Right. <laughs> right. right. Maybe Member Guzman might be able to go fishing that day. Uh, we could also find out because seasick all at the same time. Yeah, also. exactly. <laughs> okay. And um, but some of these may adjust just depending on on what what's going on at the time. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, if you have a major issue with the date that you know right now, and you maybe can let Jennifer know sooner than later, it would help us adjust. We're trying to get these fairly locked in so that you, we know some of you have very, very busy lives and plans. And so we wanna make sure you kind of can forecast out and lock the dates in, so. Okay, and then again, as we've done in the past, uh, we've kind of given direction as to what we'd like to see on some of the agendas. Um, 2022 uh, for October has quite a few items already on it, um, but it, but then when we move into 2023, so just be thinking about future board member board meeting topics, and if you have something of particular interest to yourself, you, whether it is um, uh, informational or just even a, a work session type thing, if you want to let Jennifer know, then she would be able to put that together. And she's really good about soliciting for whatever it is that we would like to know too. So, and remember early, we'll we'll, or we'll we'll add some of these we know, like at Newport, we're going to talk about Clean Marina the day before, so like that'd be. So we'll we'll go through and add some of the things right. that we know. Klamath, we're going to talk about the dams and the access and water. So we'll go through and make sure we add all those as well. Okay. Can somebody remind me of the October dates for this coming October? 26, 27. Uh, okay. Whenever my calendar and Jennifer tell me I'm supposed to get in the car, that's, <laughs> that's when. Okay. Um, so uh, now we are on item number I, which is the board chair election and vice chair appointment. So um, we need action on this one. Colleen, I see her coming back on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm never sure when you can or can't see me. So yeah, I see, her, I, I see it on mute. I, I'm getting good at seeing it get unmuted, and then I see that you're you're popping up there. I know you want to say something. <laughs> I thought to wave to get your attention. Um, I move that we elect Laura to be our chair for next the next session. I'll second that. Okay. Um, I accept. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. No, I'm not going to do it. I refuse. <laughs> okay, so then uh, we we would need a vice chair as well. So um, if anybody, I'll nominate Colleen to be the vice chair. Thank you for that, member Withy. Unfortunately, I will have to decline. Um, Need to be reasonable with the demands on my time and my personal life. Not to mention the October board meeting, I think is just like weeks away from the second coming of. <laughs> well, maybe we'll I have will have a newborn by the time of the October meeting, so my hands will be a little bit full for the coming months. <laughs> yes. Maybe we won't have any advice before then. <laughs> well, how about? Uh, Chair sure, Early, you'd be coming up as chair. I'm happy to do it for as long as I'm here. <laughs> then you can provide any guidance that the chair might need. Yeah. Totally. Okay. I like, sheets. like all my cheat sheets. Okay. And I so, oh. oh, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, we have a chair and a vice chair. All those in favor, please say aye. All right. Aye. 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 Okay. So now, according to item E, the J, sorry, we are and we are going to be moving into an executive session. The Oregon State Marine Board will now meet in executive session pursuant to ORS 192660 section 2I, which allows us to meet in executive session to review and evaluate the performance of an officer, employee or staff member. 
Representatives of the media and designated staff will be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed to not to report on or otherwise disclose any of the deliberations or anything said about these subjects during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decisions will be made in executive session, and at the end of the executive session, we will return to an open session and welcome the audience back into the room. So if anybody needs to make a quick bathroom, okay. You leaving there? Yeah, right there. <laughs> I look like a good train. Can you all hear me? I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Colleen, you'll need to dial in to- Okay, that was what I, I was trying to ask. Do I need to dial yeah. in? Please, thank you. Um, okay, you can you send me that number again? Sorry, it's hard to toggle back and forth. Thanks. Okay. Yep, she said, just give her a moment.
Well, I don't. He, I don't even see him out there. Uh, he's behind the bathroom door. Oh, he is. Oh, okay. He's fine. Okay. We're live. Okay, so this is the Oregon State Marine Board uh, meeting for July 28th. Um, we are in Curry County. We are finished with our executive session, so we are resuming our regular meeting. Um, we do have a quorum still here present. Uh, we just had one more item of business. Uh, Craig. Yeah, we were talking about having a uh, get together at Salem at the end of uh, August. Could you update us on that, Jennifer? Yes, we are still planning to have a board day with staff. And the current date held for that is August 31st. So that's board members meeting with staff and just a kind of a meet and greet and figure out what everybody does there at that time. Okay. And then the af afternoon for anyone who wants to, we would arrange to go visit. Um, we've got Buena Vista under major construction. Right. And we've put a lot of money into that. So any board members that want to see what an active construction site looks like and where all your money goes, as long as you don't tell people about Buena Vista. Oh, wait, we're not. What oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And um, congratulations to Laura. She is our new uh, chair elect. I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and with that, uh, we are officially adjourned.